Okay, thanks. Some days there are thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. So there's a bus stop. Uh, this is the uh, elected officials' transportation <laughs> committee meeting for Thursday, October 18th. One of our <laughs> quarterly meetings. Let's get out of here. Or so uh, we don't need attendance, do we? We have a loaded agenda tonight. We'll try to move through this quickly. Um, some key discussion points will happen around the budget, but let's jump into some special announcements uh, with Brian. Brian, you want to start? You want to say a few words? Come on up. Well, tonight's a special night for a few reasons. One is it's an EOTC meeting. That's always special. Oh, yeah. It's special. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, more importantly, or as importantly, it's uh, two people's final EOTC meeting that have been here quite a long time, uh, Rachel Richards and Tom Oaken. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So we put together a couple gifts for them uh, to send them off, but I wanted to say a couple uh -oh. things. <laughs> uh, Tom, I just wanted to, st uh, what I appreciate about them both, one is with Tom, uh, his quiet intelligence. He always brings compassion to a budget question, yep. and with his history and his conservative approach to budgeting, I think he's really helped Pitkin County out over the decades, four decades to be exact, since 1978. He was there when we drug old buses from Chicago to Pitkin County and started the Valley bus system. I happen to know two people that were in one of those buses when it broke down in Iowa. Uh, they were brothers. One of the brothers got in the back of the bus and operated the engine accelerator with a broom handle, while his brother, who was driving the bus, told him to accelerate or decelerate all across the United States to Aspen, Colorado. <laughs> Tom was here for that. Uh, Rachel was one of the founders and the last one of the EOTC sitting committee now. Uh, what I appreciate about Rachel is her mind. She has an impeccable ability to remember data and facts and happenings that I, it just astounds me. Mm -hmm. And when you check her fact that she just came out with of her mind, she's accurate. It's right. So I will miss that part of your ability to, and I heard a term today, uh, your tribal knowledge. Tribal knowledge. There we go. That's impressive. <laughs> I'm a tribal elder now. <laughs> that is impressive. So staff put together a couple of gifts for these two individuals. They're, they're lock boxes. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that is the funniest I've ever heard. Wonderful prizes. Oh, prizes that we'll use forever. I think they're backwards. I think they're backwards. Yeah, yeah, you right. Right. Did you have the right one? The other one has an R on it. Really fun. Yeah. Oh, the other one has the R on it. Is that from Rachel? Oh, yeah, you got the wrong one. Oh, yeah, I'm not so sure. Is this like a let's make a deal? <laughs> one has a pink hat, the other has a pink hat. Tom, what are you going to do? Retire. Wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Come January, You're not skating that old. all the time rather than just part time. Maybe it's full of Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well. Come on, open it. we got to know what's inside. Well, it's locked. They don't know the combination. It's locked. It is locked. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's the joke. You can't it's a velociraptor. <laughs> <laughs> and hats from every department imaginable. Oh, wow. oh my gosh. And wonderful uh, travel mugs, which I need all the time. And a snowmass shirt. Thank you, snowmass. Oh, that's looks so like cool. a shirt. That's great. So. Yeah, Thank you. That's <laughs> Except you didn't get the pink hat. <laughs> You know, I, I was thinking about it for a moment when I came over here tonight, that uh, when we first started working on transportation issues, um, our facilitator uh, unfortunately named us the decision makers. <laughs> and that didn't last for very long before it was renamed the Elected Officials Transportation Commission. I think it was uh, Jack Hatfield who particularly objected to that name, oh, I'm sure the did. decision makers meeting. And uh, it actually is a little sad to think that at least uh, two of the members uh, who I was working with have passed away with Jack and Bill Toot. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to remember if Tom Blake was part of that early, early effort 
I or think not. he was. I think he yeah. may have been on the board as well yeah. then. So, uh, you know, we've all come a long way. We've all worked hard. We've got good results, you know, and we just got to keep at it. Thank you. George. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Rachel, and thanks, Tom. I, it was interesting. I, I, was, I had a meeting with John Bennett uh, a week ago or so. We were trying, I was trying to give him some information on uh, Rafter's Ballot 7A to get his endorsement, and, I, and he finally did come along and, and contribute and endorse. And he was saying, well, you know, what, what will this do? It, it's, it's so important for communities to work together to, uh, to achieve these common goals. And I said, well, look at the ELTC. Um, you know, we've been able to to work together the last few years, and, and, we, and we've been able to get away from this concept of a lockbox. And John goes, what's a lockbox? <laughs> he had never even heard of that term. So we have come a long ways, uh, thanks to Rachel and Tom, and, and for all of us to get away from the lockbox, and we'll be discussing that as we move on to budget today, tonight. Yeah, yeah, great. That's tough. That's good. Thank you, Tom and Rachel. I always wonder about the uh, depth of historical knowledge that we lose, Rachel. And I've, always, I've marked over the years how fortunate we are to have the, the um, depth of your experience on, on all matters housing, from housing to transportation. And I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that we can be as constructive and successful moving forward as we have been in the past because of your, your work. So I'm sure you will be. Good. So thank you, guys. Um, Brian, good? Just, yes, one other thing. Uh, just want to introduce uh, David Pesnichak, who is our Regional Transportation Administrator. He's sitting next to John. Uh, he comes from Garfield County and uh, did some transportation planning in Lincoln, Nebraska. I've been following David around the last month or so on what I call his listening tour. And I will say, if he performs as well as he listens, we will have no problems. <laughs> because he's an outstanding listener and uh, asks great questions. So. David's uh, first meeting. Welcome. Yeah, good. Welcome, David. Thank you. David, when was your first day? Uh, September 24th. Yeah. So, so he's just a few weeks in. He's fully oriented. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still seeing traffic at the entrance to Aspen, David. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned that to him this morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, John. Welcome, David. Thank We're you. glad to have you. Likewise. You can see transition uh, happening before our very eyes. So. Um, good. We'll move to we'll move to public comments. Floor is open for comments on things, anything you want to talk about. Com okay, we'll close public comment um, and move. Uh, we're going to move to uh, review of decisions reached at the June 14th meeting. John, you want to? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, the last meeting was June 14th this summer, and. Uh, we had an update on the RAFTA Destination 2040, uh, get on board with RAFTA, and the statewide ballot measures by uh, Ralph, Bill Ray, and Dan. Uh, this is just an information item. Um, the campaign is underway right now, and uh, the vote's coming up, so everybody vote. Uh, the next item we had was the Buttermilk Pedestrian Crossing. Uh, there was a funding request for um, $800,000 for design engineering and exploration of funding partners. Um, and the EOD, EOTC uh, denied that funding request uh, at that meeting. And then the rest of the meeting was mostly updates, battery electric bus program, uh, which is a joint program between the city of Aspen and RAFTA. Um, it's currently underway. And in the update today, basically, the, uh, I think the contract is executed. Uh, the busts are slotted in per, for production, and we'll see them next uh, in 2019. Uh, the regional transportation position, David's here tonight. Uh, that went from uh, interviews to uh, his selection. And then we had uh, the, the update on the Castle Creek Bridge. We ran out of time at the meeting, but that's proceeding and should be done by the end of October, May, first part of November. So that was the June 14th meeting, Mr. Mayor. Good. Thanks, John. John, real quick, when do we see those buses and where are they going to, what route, do, have the routes been decided yet? And do we well, know where we can? It's a, the battery electric bus program is an eight bus pilot program between the city of Aspen and RAFTA. Um, it has 
five, four or five different funding partners, if you remember. The city of Aspen is putting in money. Raft is putting in money about the same. The EOTC is contributing. There is some thousand dollars from a federal loan -O grant. And then there's a combination of state faster and Senate Bill 1 funding that makes up the 8.5 million or so for the buses and the chargers. Um, we, the the uh, manufacturer selected was New Flyer. Um, I'm being told the production slots are already uh, set up and they may be here late summer, early fall next year and then we might have them online by the end of 2019. But we not only get the buses, we got to get the chargers and the charging piece all in place out at the uh, Aspen AMF. They're going to be run in the Upper Valley, uh, four of them or so on Aspen routes, and then we've got four others for spares, snow mass, buttermilk. Uh, it, we're going to have to work with Raft on that to see where we can send them, and that'll be part of the experiment pilot program. How well do they work? They might, we might even run one down to Glenwood, see how that does, um, because if ballot 7A passes, uh, a big part of that is looking at electric buses on the uh, valley system for Rafta. So I think it'll be uh, real interesting to see. We need to keep in mind that it is an experiment in a pilot program, and it's a new technology. It's not new to the nation or the industry, but it's going to be new up here. and. We're going to have to see how the charging and, and the range works on those and how well they do in the winter and altitude. So I think it's a great step forward and a great program for, for the community. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, Greg. Just a question for John. I remember at one, one meeting we had a, a, a citizen was talking about the, the pollution issues with the buses at Highlands and the, the Maroon Bells route, and I'm just wondering, will that be part of the experiment so we can see if, if how things work up there? Yeah, we'll definitely run them up to Highlands. Um, I don't know about the Bells. We need to talk raft on us to see how that route and the mileage and the range will work. But, yeah, that's the whole point. There's zero emission uh, buses, and they're very quiet, and so that's the whole point of to get these in the fleet, try them in various places. And then um, if Rafta gets the funding, they're looking at more of those. And the city probably would also, when we replace the rest of our fleet, start bringing <coughs> those buses in and using them in more areas. The Bells is a perfect fit for them right. if the range and the batteries and all that right. technology works. Yeah, thanks, Greg. That was Adriana Leensman, and some of those old buses um, are being or have been replaced already. Some of those, I think those are the Neoplan. Yeah, the Neoplan burning. buses there, uh, <laughs> the manufacturer doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we ran those for 16, 17 years, over 600,000 miles. The manufacturer's out of business. It used to be in Lamar. And so getting parts and pieces for them. And those are some of the, vi the worst violators. Yeah, noisy. Um, diesel buses that these so the electric buses are replacing them great thanks john yeah john do they have uh, regenerative braking so that yeah yes coming they down do. from the bells yeah yes they do we there we ran up some demos up the snow mass and watch that um it doesn't fully recharge the battery but you do get some recharging on it great uh john should we jump to uh, option of the 2019 meeting dates? Yes, sir. Quickly. I can't make any of this. <laughs> 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 Come this on, is, Rachel. This credit. is the most important part of the meeting is to try to set these dates with you all. Um, so we've got, we've been, had three meetings a year, quarterly more or less. So the first one would be March 21st, which is a Thursday, 4 o'clock in Snowmass. That's one day from different from last year's meeting. Then June 20th with Pitkin County and the new Pitkin County facilities, I'm assuming. And then October here, October 17th. Um, so if you're all in favor of those, <laughs> or unless there's any cast or crest or whatever other okay. Northwest cog. No, at this conflicts. point, let's, let's, at this point, let's move forward with those dates. And thank you. I'll assume those are approved. Okay, good. We'll move now to the proposed budget, and I will call on 
Tom Oaken one final time. Tom? This will be his final budget meeting. Wow. We're counting on you, Tom. <laughs> uh, I don't think there's anything controversial this year, <laughs> but I'm sure you can prove me wrong. Um, so I was going to ask David if uh, he'd like to do the budget with you guys, but he respectfully declined and said, <laughs> you can have it one more time. Uh, but in the future, that's who you get to look to. Uh, so <coughs> we'll run through it on the uh, spreadsheet here. And typically, we approve it in kind of two steps. One's just the base budget that recurs pretty much uh, every year or has already been approved uh, in prior years to just keep continuing. And then there are two new requests this year at the end that we'll consider separately. Uh, so we start out with uh, funding sources. You have $5.8 million in the half cent sales tax. Of that, 81% uh, comes off the top and funds RAFTA, leaving you 1.1 million net of that sales tax. That's projected as a 4% increase over 2018. And for 2018, well, we're thinking we'll be up 5%. So pretty consistent along there. The uh, next item is the half percent use tax, which is levied on motor vehicles and building materials that are purchased outside of the county and brought into the county for use. Uh, that is mostly on building materials, probably three quarters of it currently comes there. That can be pretty volatile, depending on the construction, level of construction here. Uh, it probably peaked back in 2017 at 1.6 million. Uh, we're projecting slightly less for this year, 1.4, and the same for mm -hmm. next year. It's been as low as 600,000, yeah. so it can vary, and that's our best guess. Tom, I should have asked this years ago, but I never did. So th that half a cent on the building materials, is that only residential and commercial versus government? Uh, government's exempt. That's what I thought. Okay, right. thank you. That's all. Thank but you. everything else. Okay. That's on the use tax line item? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was hoping we weren't taxing ourselves. Right. Uh, <laughs> the other exemption <laughs> uh, from state law is on ski lifts. We tried for that originally, and uh, skiing company or the ski industry in general got special legislation to exempt them from use tax collection. So um, that's the only other exemption. Uh, then we have investment income, uh, which varies depending on the level of interest rates and how much we have to invest. Uh, 187,000, so about 2.7 million in total next year in funding sources. Then we move on and deduct funding uses. The ongoing operational items start with use tax collection costs. Uh, 93,000 next year, that's up from this year and some prior years, although in the past we did spend as much as 100,000 uh, on collection. That's up because the county finance department is increased the staffing and dedication towards that collection and also because of the much higher level of uh, use tax that we're collecting. Uh, the next item, administrative cost allocation and meeting costs. Uh, the meeting costs are like $3,000 for grassroots film. Uh, the rest of that is county overhead uh, for managing this fund. Then we have country and taxi program, uh, $4,000. Uh, that's been fairly underutilized. Uh, at one point, I think we spent as much as 10, 11,000, but it's pretty minor, so we're uh, reducing that actually. Uh, X Games Transit Subsidy has been approved for several years at 115000 
technically, you've approved it through next year uh, already, but of course, you could pull the plug anytime you want to annually. Uh, there is a memo in your packet from Aspen Skiing Company uh, to update you on that. Brush Creek intercept lot operating costs. Uh, this, the Brush Creek lot is operated by City of Aspen Parking Department, and this doesn't represent their time, but represents uh, utilities, irrigation, snow plowing, you know, just routine maintenance out there of the lot. Then there's No Fair Aspen Snowmass Woody Creek Bus Service at 662000 which is just slightly up from 650000 this year. And those are actual figures because what we came to agreement with a few years ago with RAFTA was that um, this is basically replacing the fares that might be collected uh, on that route. And so we look back to, it's in the memo, when was it? Uh, yeah, back in 2010, uh, the was the first year of no fare service and they estimated that uh, the lost fare revenue at that time was 36.7% of the cost the operating cost, not capital cost, but the operating cost of running those routes. So we agreed to set it at that percent of RAFTA's actual costs two years prior to the budget year because we would have those figures available and know what they were. So the 2019 budget, which will also be actual, is based on the 2017 actual audited costs uh, from RAFTA. Right. So that's how that's working. Uh, the next two years out uh, after that show large increases, but they're based on RAFTA's current 2018 budget and their projected 2019 budget. And for some reason, their budget is always much higher than it actually comes in at. So we'll hope that continues. Uh, but that's why those figures are higher out there. They're based on the, on the raft of budgets. Next item, uh, we cycle operational support was approved uh, last year to uh, continue. Uh, actually, it was approved three years ago initially for one year. And then last year, the request was for $100,000 of support for a two-year period. Uh, so that's shown in the 2019 budget, but ending after that, uh, I would guess you may hear from them <laughs> next year. Uh, again, there's a memo updating you on that in uh, the packet. Uh, then we have the Brush Creek BRT connecting service, uh, which uh, was first approved last year, 294,000. It is in the proposed budget next year at uh, $419,000. Um, one of the reasons for the increase is that uh, in estimating the 294 last year, RAFTA missed a time period when they needed to provide service. Uh, and there's some increasing costs from Snowmass in there when they run the system as well. Uh, RAFTA has that full amount in their budget for next year. The if matters. their ballot question passes, if it doesn't, uh, Michael Yang, their finance financial officer, has said that he'll negotiate with us <laughs> to get the cost down from 419,000. RAFTA might be able to pick up some of that. He indicated. Hey, Marky. So. Tom, We've, Tom, hold on. Marky, what uh, what does the increased service look like? How many? More oh, it's places? awesome. Uh, at the RAFTA meeting last week, and I know Dan is here, so he'll correct me where I'm wrong. the The use of the bus service from Snowmass to the Intercept was up 23 percent out of Snowmass. Great. 
so what are what's being added a second hourly bus or something it's every 15 minutes service yeah great awesome. headway from so, yeah it used to be 30. yeah good it makes the commute a lot easier and it's getting used it's getting used people people are taking that bus yeah good particularly if you have to commute down valley or up valley so thank you dan okay good Tom. Mm -hmm. so we did put it in the budget in case 7a doesn't pass uh you know you could you could remove it um but then we'd have to have an emergency meeting if it doesn't pass uh to come back and figure out how to fund that you know it's going to get worse with uh, the limelight opening now a lot more people are going to be taking that bus we're going to add something down true i i was just going to say that I believe there's going to be an EOTC meeting in the first quarter, right, of next year? March. March. So uh, we might not need an emergency meeting, but uh, we could maybe address that in the, uh, at the March meeting because the uh, service <laughs> increases for snow mass really are in the spring, summer, and fall. During the winter, there's a lot of service because of the contract for the skier shuttle. So based, well, on, the the, based on the outcome of the vote, the November vote right. on 7A, right. we may or may not meet a, need a meeting right. to address funding um, should it not come as a result of right. a winning ballot issue. Okay. Right. All right. But we'll have Only if you want to remove it, this, you this doesn't pass from, your this option. from the budget. Okay. Um, just, just leave if it, it doesn't right pass, it's proposed to be in your budget and we'll negotiate with RAFTA or David will... <laughs> uh, and come up with uh, what the cost is, and you can probably review that at your March meeting. Okay, good. If it comes to that. Uh, yeah, so the final um, operational item here is David, the regional transportation administrator. That's in at 139000 Actually, the county budget director informed me that's actually... I missed an item that's supposed to be 141,000. So, missed a couple grand there getting that in here. Uh, so, your total operating expenses for next year are projected to be about 1.6 million, uh, leaving you 1.1 million uh, for projects. Tom, hold on one sec. Ann has a yep. question for you. Yeah, I'm just sure. on a couple of the operational costs. Okay. Could you explain again? Oh. <laughs> Um, could you explain again what the Aspen Country Inn, um, what that service is? Sure. Uh, that's uh, senior housing out there. Right. And uh, basically that service was instituted instead of building an underpass at that location uh, because uh, any of the seniors taking a bus into town and then returning on the bus would have to walk across Highway 82 at that location. Or if they're going down Valley from the Country Inn, they'd have to walk across. And so in lieu of walking across, they're allowed to call a taxi in town to take them back after riding the bus into town. Okay. Uh, so that's what that pays for is just those taxi trips. So the use is decreasing though? Yeah. Yeah, Again, has I think the question to do a pretty is, minimal level. Yeah, is the money spent in the best place? Should we can be considering some other alternative? Uh, but if seems to be pretty cheap yeah, <laughs> right okay. now, and much cheaper than building an underpass. Right, I think. right. And it depends who's out there as to the use. I mean, in the past, depending who's living out there, we've had some people that use it a lot, mm -hmm. and then maybe they move out, and then. Okay. So it's just recently you had anybody using it, but in the past we've had a lot of use. I know the place okay, so I'm just I want to make sure we're providing the best service we can and it's most economical. Yeah, it's a safety issue, people crossing Highway 82, particularly of senior seniors out there. So, um, yeah, at the time, uh, the, the EOTC was looking at a million-dollar underpass, which you wouldn't get close to that now, but uh, so that was in lieu of, of building the underpass. Yeah. I thought it was a little less than that, but around 600000 but it was debated, and it was at the same time that the bus lane was added. 
And right. that was would have been the opportunity to add the underpass. Oh, okay. Was when the bus lane was added, and people said, "No, it'd be better to just pay annually for some other service." But if it fits in better with some of the other programs that the city is starting to fund now, I mean, we certainly should look at it, flexibility there. If it fits in with right. something else you're doing with the shift program, um, but it was a commitment that we all made when we knew we weren't funding the underpass. Yeah, I just wanted to make yeah. sure it was we were it's evaluating a, it. It's um, a, I'll make a I just want to add on to that. It's a very, very important service. There is no way that many of the elderly that live there. Could oh no, I understand that. Under that yeah. underpass. Yeah. <clears throat> if there were one. So it's interesting that we're talking about the item with has the least <laughs> amount of money in it. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, looking, more, sorry. I I would love to see a a path along that side of the highway all the way from Truscott bus stop. Yes. clear to buttermilk uh, it's just about the same distance for the people from Aspen country and to cross the highway and get to the bus stop across there as it is to walk down to Truscott and go through the underpass to that one and there they already have an underpass so I just wanted to point that out that they they have a very viable option and maybe there maybe we would need to do a little improvement to get them onto the maroon the old maroon creek bridge i think it's a dirt path or something right there okay and maybe we should look into improving that just to give them one other option to get to trust good easily and safely and maybe sometime we could drop this the four thousand yeah, dollars unless nice. there's someone who is more has a mobility issue it's and mobility can't go that far and that's where we need to keep the service yeah yeah good in yeah. um yeah just a couple more the 115,000 for x games um what other transfer who who else subsidizes transportation for the x games how much what what proportion is that 115 of the transportation costs yeah, I did, dan <laughs> I'm just going to step here. Yeah. <laughs> Make yourself comfortable. Well, I can't give you a precise percentage or even the dollar amounts, but um, we have this uh, agreement with the Aspen Skiing Company to provide service between Aspen and Snowmass and between Aspen and Buttermilk. So uh, we uh, provide quite a bit of service during the X Games under that contract that we get reimbursed for. <clears throat> But then there are some specific things that we do in terms of egress after the concerts and so forth uh, and after the, the major events when the uh, contractors that uh, Ski Company and ESPN work with are overwhelmed. They use Ramblin' Express and they use um, uh, Rocky Mountain who uh, come in every year and provide a lot of service for the games between uh, Buttermilk and the Intercept Lot. and. I think they maybe run some buses uh, between Buttermilk and town. So um, that $119,000, I think RAFT is, is receives typically about 50000 of that or somewhere in that neighborhood, and the balance is going to those other contractors. If you increase service down Valley for the guests coming up for the next game? We ramp up. We ramp up our services, and uh, we typically uh, see, uh, you know, a significant increase in ridership. And uh, we did an analysis a few years ago that uh, indicated that a large portion of the service cost was being covered by fares. I think in the past year or two, the city may have helped to offset uh, the fares uh, in the Down Valley direction, or RAFTA is doing it kind of unilaterally after the big event on Saturdays because of the pushing and the shoving and the length of time it takes to board and take fares in the down valley direction after the event. So we just board people and take them. But uh, yeah, I can give you a more precise accounting, well, at least of Rafta's costs, um, because I don't know exactly what ESPN and Ski Company are paying Ramblin' and Rocky Mountain. And last, <laughs> 32000 is that 100% of the operating costs of the uh, intercept lot? Yeah, it, it goes toward, um, there's a cleaning. We do trash pickup, right. snow removal, uh, the electricity bill for the lights, 
um, room service to the people who are living out there. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but but that's that's the total cost, or is there some some other group? Irrigation. No, that's the total cost yeah. right now okay. of operating. Uh, okay. We're doing some landscaping work, um, all sorts of different kind of maintenance operational issues out there. Which part? Okay. The bike off. Thanks. Steve. Uh, Greg, please. Uh, if we could, I'd, I'd just love to ask a few more questions about the X Games. I, I remember uh, the Sheriff's Department coming to us last year for a supplemental to help cover the costs that they outlaid, the, their costs of operating, doing additional uh, service for X Games, and I think it was the tune of $40,000. So that was to pick in county. If we add that to the 115 that we're subsidizing to the X Games, um, and you just talked about the I guess apparently there's a use tax exemption for ski companies. So I'm just, I'm looking at this thinking, wow, this is an expensive subsidy we're giving to the X Games. And I'm concerned, I'd love to learn more about it because I think uh, ESPN is a highly profitable, the most profitable TV network in the world, if not the country. They sell a lot of advertising. There, this, this letter talks about how many viewers they have. I keep thinking, you know, one ad sale would cover the cost of all this, and I'm not sure that my money is best spent subsidizing this. I, I have a problem with it, and maybe I can be convinced others otherwise. But I, you know, it, it, when it was a startup and it was first starting, the X Games was a, a speculative venture, but they've been in business now for 15 years, and they're growing every year. And I'm sure, they probably had some hard times, but I also wonder if maybe they can carry their own weight now. Just love to put that out there. Uh, Justin Erickson from the ski company is yeah. here if you want to ask him. You want to come up and yeah. if there's anything specifically. Uh, this is this expense for the transportation been in place for a while is something the EOTC and the communities wanted to do to help get the service out there. It was kind of a safety thing um, and to get it at a high <coughs> level uh, and and make the X Games work. But I'll, yeah, and a lot of this is, oh, sorry, uh, Justin Erickson, Aspen Skiing Company. So a lot of the asks are, you know, things that we as a community are providing to ESPN to get them here. And so, you know, the, one of the ways we're looking at this is it's a benefit to the whole community. And we, you know, with the transportation, Aspen Skiing Company is bringing a lot to the table beyond what's funded here um, and just across the board. Greg, the, it, it's, it, it's the community's part to help support the ski company's role in the event. So it's, you can argue that it's indirectly subsidizing ESPN, but it, it's really um, us supporting the ski company. I believe, Buck, is that accurate? Yeah, in just our bid to, to get them here. Yeah, yep. yeah. And Rachel, specifically, was next, but yeah, no, specifically, Mr. Mr. Mayor, toward the cost of all the transportation and all the other vendors that come in to help provide that. Yeah, good. Uh, George? Yeah, I mean, this is a tremendous event for the entire community, Aspen and Snowmass. Uh, we get, uh, there's uh, the only other event that, that sort of gets the national, the world press uh, as the, of, of the X Games was the pro cycling race, which uh, the county helped to subsidize as well. And we did that because of the, the great ex exposure that we get for that, which drives sales taxes, which helps our, all, all of our other programs. So uh, it's a partnership, it's a community benefit, and I think it's, it's valuable for us to continue to support the X Games. Um, at some point, I'm sure the X Games are going to find a different venue. If I could just follow up on that, it'd be great to see just what we get in tax revenue and how the X Games bumps our local economy. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd love to just see that and, and get an idea of just what it means for us. What kind of investment are we making and what, what is the return we're getting? Yeah, um, I, I can understand that it, 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 it's probably hard to get daily sales tax collection numbers as opposed to monthly, but you can see what it does for the month of January, which has always been uh, really an off season, you know, low month. That's why we came up with winter school, you know, things like that. Um, I, I just really agree with George and. Uh, you know, times go up and down in terms of the economy, but uh, when we were looking at the big recession in 2008, 2009, um, out of our county budget, we had set aside a certain amount of money towards economic development, and the X Games was considered one of those. And so we have a threshold 
um, and criteria uh, of looking at things like that, and one of those is national broadcast um, exposure. Um, and you know, if you go back in time, there was a point at which uh, the ski company and the Aspen Mountain and these things were starting to be known as your grandfather's resort, you know, that sort of thing. And the X Games changed it all. The X Games changed it to being, I want to go where my kids want to go, and my kids want to go where the X Games were. And so it's, to my mind, it's made a huge difference. And, you know, I can understand wanting to say, ah, uh, not spend the money, but the, the benefit is hard to see if it's a March booking because they came because they saw the X Games on TV as opposed to just that week in January. But in, as I understand it, it fills every lodge bed in the entire valley, That's you true. know. So, you know, it's, it, it does go throughout the valley. Um, and so I, I'm very supportive of it. Uh, it. They will, they do renegotiate the contract fairly regularly. I don't know how much longer we have it for. Uh, it is an ideal venue in many ways, and that's why we've worked to keep it that way, I, I guess, and um, to keep that there. The last thing I would say is that um, you just don't want to see all those people driving or beginning to drive. And we've worked out over the years the, the many, many issues that have uh, resulted around safety and having enough buses and where the concerts should go and things like that. But um, I can't imagine trying to reinvent a new event yeah. that would be comparable uh, for our name recognition if there was no X Games. Great. And so I, I just, I'd let it go at that. But, you know, I, I, you know, I know sometimes people are tired of it and tired of the noise and kind of ask, but I know all the young kids are just as excited as could be. It's almost an event for our youngsters. So I, I support it and, and the extra expense of the sheriff's office, too. Does the county contribute any addition? Um, no, just the, the safety. It, well, again, it's an extra $40,000 worth of payroll with the sheriff's yeah, office. Yeah. So it's kind of an in-kind contribution through yeah. it. Yeah. How much do we? 180000 on top of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Snowmass Village. Because mm -hmm. the city makes a, a similar co cash contribution. Yeah, 43. Yeah. I, I was on council once when they were in the middle of X Games um, discussions, and we added an extra $50,000 for nighttime lighting. You know, it was just that important to keep it here. It's so similar to food and wine. They always want a little startup money each year, and it's a successful event. Good. Greg, good? Um, I'm not entirely satisfied, but I'll, we'll keep okay. drilling on it. Can, can, I, can I add one thing? Yeah, Mike, just, I just, just had a question for Dan. Sorry, Michael Miracle Aspen Skiing Company, too. Um, I sit in on a lot of transportation stuff for us. So the, the Ski Co. contract with RAFTA was just renegotiated. Um, and what was a $2.5 million per year contribution to, to help pay for our use of the ski shuttles and things like that is, is going up to $2.9 million next year, if that helps create any more comfort around this. Okay, thanks, Mike. Buck, anything else you want to add? No, just thank you guys for the continued support on this. So. I, I have one last small thing. You know, there was a point in time when uh, a different ski company leadership had proposed um, setting their fares to say that your daily rate was $80 plus $2 buses. And they were going to put it on all, all the bulletins and everything like that. And it took a lot of work to convince them that the price of the transportation should be built into the ticket. And so we're all in partnership now. And, and that makes a difference. And, and so I just want to make sure we realize that they're just eating that cost. And then also, it used to be that skier shuttles were only for skiers to come back. But now they will stop and pick up other people as well along the route and that's part of the more integrated service we have good okay great the last thing is while we're integrating service I'd, I'd certainly would love to see the skier shuttles be able to use the HOV lanes thank you well, I think he's talking about the ones from buttermilk that uh, the ski company provides to Highlands is that the one you're certainly yeah which ones? Future Go. conversation. Well, just, so it's really frustrating when you're in a, an H, in, a, in a full bus and it's not allowed to use the HOV lane. That would be Buttermilk to Highlands. I don't know where else, Dan, but I've experienced it there. People is, it, are, is it a rafta bus? It's a rafta bus. It's a ra no. Or is it a van? It's, is it a van? It's not a rafta bus. If it was a rafta sanctioned bus, it could do yeah. it. Could you put a portable mic in your budget for next year so I can just <laughs> <laughs> do these with that? Well, the, the ski company. <laughs> Thanks, Buck. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, this chair is kind of low, but uh, by virtue of, uh, I think, some approvals that they had for the Highlands Base uh, area development uh, way back when, 
agreed to run a shuttle from Buttermilk where there's parking available for people that want to ski in Highlands and, you know, there may not be sufficient uh, capacity in their uh, parking lot up there. So they run a shuttle back and forth from Buttermilk. And uh, your concern is that that shuttle is not allowed in the HOV lane, and so uh, the time that people spend on the bus is pretty lengthy, depending upon the time of day when they're trying to get on the mountain. And so I think that's something that, um, you know, this year uh, with the shift program, actually it'll be next year, uh, that experiment, there's going to be some ramped up service from the intercept lot, and, and there are going to be some private providers that are going to be using that lane uh, and we're going to try to brand those vehicles so people know that they're kind of doing it in partnership with RAFT and with the SHIP program in the city so that everybody doesn't believe that, hey, you know, I've got a van or I've got whatever and I can just jump in that lane as well. Uh, so the issue that you've identified would be one that maybe could be a part of that discussion in the future when we could look at it and say, well, maybe there's a way to brand it, make it so that um, those kinds of vehicles uh, could use that lane because there is capacity, but we're we're just afraid that if we, it could be a slippery slope if we open it up to too many people, and then the buses start to be delayed, and um, and then people get uh, inconvenienced and they have longer travel times, and they go, well, you know, I'm not going to ride this bus anymore because uh, yeah, I don't yeah, have the, an edge. The, the big picture was the, the HOV lane was the result of an agreement that it would be used only for rapid buses, buses. a bus only lane, right? Yeah. That's what it was. So. But, yeah, yeah. The, a bus Thank only you. lane that but the bus and it had to be a raft of bus a raft of buses on it and school buses yeah okay. i guess that's the question without hopefully not opening up a can of worms <laughs> is it a raft -a lane or is it a bus lane because raft doesn't have uh, a monopoly on buses there are the schools it's a it's a and public so bus lane and record of decision that that drives that okay so when it comes to bus loads really big vans that have 40 people on them even if it's in the private sector does that qualify or who signs off on that or the answer is, is no right now the use is rafta public or public transit school buses and emergency vehicles okay and that's the way the record of decision okay. and there was a up. an open space vote too right that right kind of limited Priority it. first so okay that's good to know so it gets to be a little bit of a gray area as to what that is so hotel shuttles no um ski yeah. coach shuttles no okay that's what i was just going to say I, unless you want that lane to be full of ritz carlton vans picking up one person at a time at the airport so it's public yeah. sector tr right. transportation right. right okay that's good for now thanks rick thank you uh, it's something that only we, that, that if we, we could put a magnetic raft to sign on those yeah. skier shuttles and solve the problem that way there, there are a lot of people that are stuck yeah. in traffic <laughs> yeah and then everybody people, putting people, 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 <laughs> signs on their car. Okay. It can't be limited oh. to the people who are getting on the vehicle. Interesting. Okay, that's okay thanks. Uh, Tom, so uh, under uh, the projects in the budget, there are four. It's the electric buses, the variable message sign, uh, Snowmass's transit station, the EOTC retreat. We heard about the electric buses. Is there more you want to add to that quickly? Uh, no, there are... Uh, the electric buses and the uh, variable message sign were actually in the budget for this year. Okay. They aren't going to be completed this year, so we will just automatically carry them forward to next year. We'll see you don't really have to approve those. And then the next two items are the new requests. Uh, before you consider those, I'd ask if you'd approve everything up to that as the base budget, and then we'll go on. At this point? Yep. I have a question on Unless you have more questions. Things quickly. Um, the no fare intercept uh, lot service, is that what used to be f uh, a fare you'd pay to the intercept and the fare, or you'd ride a free bus to the intercept lot and then get off and ride a free bus to Snowmass? And then one day we learned it was, it could be free the whole way? Uh, there used to be a charge between Aspen and Snowmass. But not between Aspen and the intercept lot. Yeah, I believe and it was so. And the same as intercept to Snowmass was free. And then someone came along and said, "You, it's free. Why don't you tell everyone that it's free?" No, there wasn't. It seemed like then, I think it was free from intercept to Snowmass and free from Aspen to the intercept, so you no, could ride. Yeah. We're, no? we're paying for lost revenue. Yeah, you're replacing the cost of the fare that was collected. That's why it's a no fare service. So was there a fare then from Aspen to the intercept lot? I believe there was. There was until a certain period of time. Okay. 
When traffic got so severe uh, during the summer and Mayor Klanderud was uh, in charge, uh, they started thinking of anything we can do to try to reduce the traffic. And so uh, the city on its own for that first summer paid for free intercept lot service. And then it started expanding from there. So there was piecemeal over the years of who could afford it and how much did it cost to subsidize it. But there, there was a time when it cost you to ride to the intercept lot. Yes. But then it was, for a while, it was free and, between, and that's where this no fare service came out of, it seemed like. Snowmass wanted to add no fare service for, for quite a while, but their original commitment to the um, RTA uh, was that they would provide fare service and that would be part of their contribution for the RTA. But many things have happened since then, including new ballot questions and new contributions and things like that. But uh, there was a time when it was formed, probably, what was that, 2001, 2000, 2001, when um, Snowmass's contribution to the RTA was going to be by keeping fares on that line. Okay. The name of getting more people off the road, we're now subsidized. Right, but it was coming from EOTC rather than wherever the free service was coming from before it became. There, there was no free service to Snowmass before. From the intercept lot? No. Oh. Okay. I thought it was I mean, free it from the intercept lot. settled from Snowmass Village did it, but not with their no. Okay. I thought it was free from the intercept no, lot to rest. It is now. Charged. They always charged it. They always charged it. It's a replacement of the fare between Aspen, the intercept, and intercept to Snowmass. So that's how it started out, the no fare service. It replaced that fare, which made it free to the rider. It's not replacing the cost of the service. Yeah. It was the fare, the, the cost of the fare. Okay. And it's and kind of gone Creek. between that. Then we added Woody Creek. Yeah. Okay. Steve? Uh, and then the second question, I see Aspen has $8 million sitting in this uh, lockbox. Uh, maybe that's... Savings, savings fund. account. Yeah, savings fund. That's maybe coming up. I, should, I can wait for that. I don't know what we do with all that money. Which is your question? Which is the question? <laughs> let's, let's get to that one, Bruce. I'll wait when we get there. Uh, George. Uh, just back on the no fear. I, you know, I think that's been very successful. It's definitely taking cars off the road, helping uh, the congestion coming in out of town. Um, but for future board discussions, when you look at the, um, the incremental cost, uh, when we started in 2017 at a little over 600000 uh, and going out to 2023, getting uh, over 900000 uh, that, that's, that's something that the, uh, this board or the future ELTC board is going to have to look at in terms of how much they want to really continue to allocate or, th or is there another funding source to help uh, subsidize that no fear. So that's a future discussion. Right. That's a good point, George. Okay, good. Uh, Can I ask a question, Steve? What's um, the, with going back to that the country and taxi program. In Northwest Cog, they provide this mountainride.org, which provides rides to seniors. Do they not utilize that? Or do they utilize that in conjunction with this program? It just seems we're paying for this and there's already a free ride service. Do they, are they I mean, maybe Mark, you know, they, know. They is who? So country? Northwest Cog provides this program, it's called Mountain Ride. Right. And you can call and you can, for seniors, and you can get rides to various things, and I know for Picking County, it's uh, for medical, but I think it's also for other services as well. Yeah. I'm not sure that it's for anything. Alyssa, else maybe oh, maybe no. David, you could find out. You could. I just I on looked on their list. website, and they said for other things as well. Okay, Alyssa, thank you for that. Alyssa's good question. So, uh, David, so <laughs> what Alyssa's asking on the, this line item around country and taxi program, is there an alternative called Mountain Ride? And yeah, if you go on to the Northwest Council. Cog website, it comes up, and they, they have different resources for the different counties, and it tells you what they will and won't do for you in yeah, the various great. counties. Yeah, great. Uh, uh, Patty Clapper's not here. She's normally our Northwest Cog person, so okay. she might be able to answer that. I know that over the years the program has changed back and forth a little. They've had problems getting enough drivers or money for it. We were part of a consortium at once, and then now it's kind of broken apart a little bit, but we'll get the details on that. I do think it's related to medical, and RAFTA also has disabled handicap pickup as well. Okay. Senior van. Senior van. Rachel's like Google. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> Love that. Uh, okay. 
general stuff in the budget? Yeah, budget. Uh, Tom asked us for an action, though, to before we talk about. The, can we just talk about the two projects and maybe sure, there's agreement on we could do the whole budget? Uh, do whatever you want. <laughs> I, I had a question on the funding sources of between, and this is a macro question: Pickens County forecasting for the sales, which is up, 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 and the Pickens County use tax, which is flat, probably peaked, and. I think those are somewhat linked. I could be wrong. I'm not sure if history shows differently, but um, and I appreciate one's the FAB, um, and one I'm not sure where the use tax assumption is coming from. But uh, I'm not sure when how those two macroeconomic indicators can be have different projections, and maybe I'm. I, I don't have, know the history. They have radically different bases because the use tax is only on. Building materials and motor vehicles. Uh, so I'm not so much focused on the motor vehicles as I am about right. it's a construction construction indicator. and and that's about 75 percent of the total comes from construction materials and so it's really dependent on the level of construction activity and. Um, to some extent, uh, I, I think pretty predictably, most of those materials are purchased outside of the county. But we do have, you know, there are some providers in the county. If you buy it in the county, you pay sales tax. If you buy it outside the county, you pay use tax. Uh, so uh, while sales tax grows generally with the economy here, the retail economy, uh, you know, the construction economy, basically we're saying we don't forecast it going up from here, from the current level, where, you know, you've got several major hotels going on and uh, other stuff. Eventually that's going to drop off too, I would suspect. So uh, we think, um, and, and that's a staff forecast not the financial advisory board although they do forecast our building inspection uh, and community development fees but for us that's just unincorporated county use taxes countywide okay i'll follow up offline i'm just interested in, in in the history of the last 20 years that those lines actually diverge as much as we're assuming they're going to diverge but we can I could be wrong about my assumption. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Two new projects in the budget. One is the... Steve, I, I'm sorry, oh, but sorry, George. If, if, if Tom wants to have this first part of the budget uh, voted on, I have to leave now okay. so I can vote on that. Uh, I have to go down to uh, Glenwood Springs City Council. They are the last council standing who has yet to uh, endorse uh, RAF to 7A every other uh, elected board from Aspen to Newcastle and two counties have endorsed 7A and so Glenwood Springs hopefully I'll get their support tonight good thanks, for doing thanks George yeah. are we voting are we, we vote as a as as one board no, individually In, by okay, okay. So we know. okay so we need George we need you here I would make a motion to approve the main budget as Okay. I would make a motion to approve the main budget as presented with uh, the future projects to be discussed after the motion. Second. second. All right, we'll do this. There's a second. We'll do this by jurisdiction. Uh, I'll start with the county. Oh, um, I'll second it then. I think I had to second it. Mark, you can't for us. Yeah. No, you okay. have to call, call yes or no. the vultures for us, for the oh, county. So for for Pitkin County. Aye. Oh, Aye. Just say all those in favor of Pickens oh. County. <laughs> yes. Aye. Okay. okay. Opposed to Pickens County. Good. Uh, thank you. A snowmass. Yes. 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 Okay. It's approved by snowmass and Aspen. All those in favor, so signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Good. Well, Good we'll thanks, George. Good luck down in Good Glenwood. Good luck. Good luck. I believe Rafta gets there if you're. Faster. Faster. <laughs> 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 the, the detour. Adam and I bust back and forth to Glenwood today, so. Oh, welcome to my commute. <laughs> uh, much to Adam's horror, by the way. 
<laughs> it was buying, uh, trying to buy a ticket. It was more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have two projects. One is the Snowmass Mall Transit Station, and the second is the EOT, EOTC Retreat. Where do we, Tom, where are we starting, or John, where are we starting on the Snowmass issue? Yeah, the 350000 for next year is for continued planning. Uh, Snowmass has requested that. Uh, that would come out of and reduce their savings fund um, because that's the primary purpose of their savings fund. And as well, we've shown possibly out in 2022 that they would use the remainder of their savings fund for construction of that project. Uh, so if Snowmass wants to add more. Oh, there's David. Yeah. Perfect. Um, hey, David, you want to comment? On page 17, we gave you information in your packet materials. This, uh, the bulleted items are directly out of the request for proposal that will be closing on October 31st. We're hoping to select a, a architectural firm for conceptual design. Uh, we're taking a different tact, which is to stay within as much as possible the confines of the available funding, as opposed to trying to solve a number of issues that are tangent to this um, the mall area so uh, the 350,000 is to get to is targeting design work to get us to let's say 40 percent drawings okay thanks David and the money the money comes from the EOTC savings fund I, I'm sorry it's no massive savings fund the EOTC saying? savings fund the yeah. former lockbox the former lockbox <laughs> <box. laughs> <Former lock box. laughs> <laughs> Snow mass savings fund. Snow mass savings fund, yeah. Um, and why is it that the entire EOTC, if Snow mass wants to use its savings fund for a snow mass project, why, why are we? It's just the structure of the EOTC from its uh, authorization that has to be approved by all three bodies. It's still part of the budget. And you remember that after this meeting, it goes back to each jurisdiction individually and must be approved by resolution right, right. by each individual body before it's a final uh, budget approval. Okay, uh, questions for David or Snowmass on the $350,000 uh, project at this point? Okay. I'd move to approve this project being added to the 2019 budget. Is there a second? Second. 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 Uh, Steve, Comment. further comments? Dave, I see there's um, some some information here about consolidating the Village Shuttle Depot with the Rafta Depot. Is that going to be a complete integration of the two and abandon the Daily Lane <coughs> Depot for the Village Shuttle, or is it just a partial sort of a consolidation? If the funding's enough to support that concept, that, that's an ultimate goal. That was an ultimate goal in the original design work we did back in 2000 and uh, through 2004. Um, it, the free fair service, a fair free service has had a sort of a negative impact on Rafta in that local trips are being made on Rafta that are occupying seats that have, should be reserved for regional passengers. And we're pretty convinced that some of that is because of the dislocation of the two mm -hmm. depots. Absolutely. And one is vertically separate, ours is vertically separated as well. And so, um, why did we want to consolidate that? It was to make sure that we were peeling the local trips off of raft as service to great more capacity. So uh, it's a goal, but if you know snow mass, it's a vertical challenge. So, um, mm -hmm. and it drives costs. So um, we're, we're keeping it in there as an option, but if uh, that can't be afforded, then we'll probably just work on making the raft a depot as good as it can be for the guests that are using it to go back and forth. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, I observed that many times. Um, and I've also seen the charts of the ridership on the village shuttle dropped off dramatically a, a few years ago. And that maybe was when the free free fare was instituted yep. was probably the main main reason for that we know those trips are real yeah those yeah. local trips are now happening on the regional service and in the peak period that's detrimental to the regional service mm -hmm. 
All right, good. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we're voting on the projects. There's a motion and a second. We do this by jurisdiction. Yeah. Again, uh, let me start with the county, Greg, Greg if we could. Okay. All in favor of the uh, update and budget request for the Snowmass Mall Transit Station? Aye. Aye. Uh, okay. Aye. Is that enough? Do you have? Okay, good. Quorum. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Marky? That's all you need. Some ass. Yes. Yes. Aye. yes. Okay, Aspen, all those in favor? So aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, elected. All right, good. And uh, thank you, David. Uh, John, EOTC retreat. Are we retreating? Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, county commissioners uh, have requested this line item for a retreat next year. And so I'll let one of the commissioners address what their thoughts are on that. Can one of those new electric buses make it to Vegas? Eventually. 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 <laughs> Downhill, isn't it? The first? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I probably can't really speak for George. He would have probably explained this better. Uh, but I think there just was a feeling among our board that we're only meeting four times a year now as a group. Uh, as Bert's pointed out, there's money in the bank. What's that going to go for? Uh, you know, we've all struggled with this issue of whether uh, operating costs will eventually eat up all the capital costs and what are our long range capital needs and plans. And so while we're not picking a date or saying it has to be a day and a half or half a day or anything like that, we just really wanted to get the idea out there that it's probably time in 2019 to, you know, really talk about where do we go from here. Uh, we'll obviously have the uh, outcomes of the ballot measures as uh, leading some direction or, or telling us what the new challenges will be. And so um, that's why we put it in there. If uh, for any reason the boards decide they don't need a retreat or can be done for less, it's just money that would roll over to next year, but we didn't want to have to make it a special request mid-year. Great. Hmm. Yeah, Albert. I think that makes sense to get together and talk about the bigger picture, which these meetings don't do. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fantastic idea. And like I said, there's $8 million there. As far as scheduling for 2019, it may make more sense uh, for at least the city's point of view to have it after the summer, after the experiment that's uh, happening. So that there's some idea yeah. of whether where to go from that experiment. So Yeah, it, it, it may be something you want to do two half days you know yeah. both to familiarize and how to launch that better and then how to uh, evaluate afterwards I, I don't know we just wanted again a placeholder for, so this board could do some long-term planning great, great idea. With and, the new plan. and also the state ballot questions if they pass there'll be uh, particularly uh, 110 there might be opportunities within that that would mash or, or fit with this or something something to look at okay good we need a Motion to second on this as well. I would motion that we include the ten thousand dollar request for a twenty nineteen retreat in the budget. So second. I'll second. We had seconds. Uh, Marky, let me start with the snowmass. Yes. 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 Right. Pitkin County. Yes. 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 And Aspen. Aye. 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 All right. Good. Good suggestion. Bert, and that addresses your earlier question about. Uh, what to do with the $8 million. What to do with $8 million. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be discussed. Welcome to the city. Right. <laughs> okay, Tom, good? <laughs> That's all I have. We, okay. I have one more question. Um, the $40,000 uh, for the um, buttermilk pedestrian analysis, has that been completed? Yes, that um, that was a presented to the last meeting just, in I June. Gonna, okay. And then off of that, uh, and that presentation was the uh, uh, budget item for engineering and design and uh, subsequently that uh, failed uh, so it was denied funding okay we might want to bring that back at some point yeah it might be a good yeah, retreat and I'm sorry, item as i or... said that i realized it was probably the meeting that i missed him <laughs> so my apologies but thanks Anne. tom again a big thank you and we'll miss you Absolutely. thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. You won't You're miss welcome. us, will you? Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. We'll continue with the agenda item. That concludes. That finishes our, our budget items. Uh, I want to say a few words on the uh, mobility lab. Uh, who do we? John and Lynn. 
Um, I'm going to I'll say a few words and then there may be some questions. Um, and Ashley's here. Mitch okay, right. or Barry may be able to help with that. Okay. Uh, so the mobility lab. Um, what we were proposing is a is this broad concept kind of a mobility system that was economically and politically feasible around a three month long experiment next summer that's regional in scope. And the broad thinking around this program really starts with, uh, is rooted in incentives. Um, and while there are carrot and sticks, this program is very much all about the carrots, um, very few sticks. Uh, it starts, so Mobility Lab starts with this notion of, a, of an app and it's called the Miles app. And the Miles app is an incentive-based program that encourages commuters to use alternatives to their cars. So uh, we're starting to test this now. We're in the very early stages. Um, so what will happen next summer is uh, we're working with this company out of Silicon Valley who's provide this app. And you'll have on your phone an, um, uh, uh, this program that provides rewards based on your mobility choice. So if you're in Glenwood Springs and you're coming to Aspen and you choose to drive, you'll receive 40 points the same way you might accumulate frequent flyer miles if you flow from point A to point B. But if you're in Glenwood and you came to Aspen and you chose to take the bus, you'll get 4,000 points. And perhaps if you biked, you might get 40,000 points. Um, at the end of a designated period, a week or a month, whatever it turns out to be, you'll have in your account a number of points based on your mobility choice. And this app has all the technology built in it to identify, it knows, I can't explain how, but it knows the choice you're making. Um, the technology is there. It basically sits on top of Google Maps and somehow it reads, it's able to know by your time and distance and choices, um, the choices you've made. At the, end of the, at the end of a designated period, say a couple weeks or a month, you'll have accumulated points just like you accumulate frequent flyer miles. You can then go to either local or national retailers and cash in those points for a reward. So if you uh, like coffee at Cafe Inc, for instance, and your morning routine is to get up to Aspen and walk over to Cafe Inc, if Cafe Inc is part of this program, and I don't know if they will or will not be, you can take your points and cash them in for coffee at Cafe Inc. If you uh, live in Glenwood and you're looking to buy a new uh, wash machine at Lowe's, uh, if Lowe's is part of the national program, you can take your points and walk over to Lowe's and cash them in and get a discount on your on your um, new wash machine. Uh, the, the people we're working with are in the process of building the relationships with the local and the national retailers. Uh, and uh, So it's a program that works a little bit like frequent flyer miles um, based on your mobility choice. So that's how the program starts. And everybody in the Valley who wants to download the app is welcome to do it, it's free, no charge. Um, and that's where the incentives come from. The program itself, uh, the mobility program itself the Mobility Lab itself is built around really four concepts, commuting, e-bikes, and on-demand service, on-demand services, and data. And data is really the heart and soul of this program. So around commuting, uh, a big part of this program will be increased raft of services. And what we're trying to do is understand if, if people are willing to carpool more. We want to understand if people are willing to park at the intercept lot and go in and out of town on buses if we increase the, increase the bus service. We want to understand if something like a direct point-to-point -point transit service, um, either uh, by subscription or otherwise, uh, can help people get their dogs and their kids and their tools and their gear. You could call and reserve a space in a van and say, I'm coming with my kids or my gear or my dogs, save a spot for me, can get us from point A to point B. Um, so that, that's kind of a commuting package. We're also looking at e-bikes, and we're trying to understand if e-bikes and cargo bikes make cycling more accessible to more people as a real transit option. We're not expecting everybody to hop out of their car and start riding bikes, but we do want to introduce a bike, this broader bike program to understand um, if it will, if it, if we can make it more accessible, if there's a real, if there's a real benefit to it, um, the third component is on-demand services, and that's kind of like what we're doing with the downtowner, and, and we're looking. We, we want to understand if we can reduce um, the need for parking downtown by expanding the downtowner concept. The downtowner concept is an app you have on your phone. You call the thing, kind of like an Uber, you know, on-demand service. Um, like an on-demand ride hailing to neighborhoods that are outside walking distance to the core. So the on-demand component is really kind of an expansion of something like the downtown or uh, working um, inside the downtown. And, and the final component, and this is really the heart and soul of the whole mobility lab, is the data itself. And, and what we want to do here is answer the public's desire 
to have more and better data for making all of these decisions in the future. And um, so we want, we want future decisions to be less option-based because now we say, should we do A or B? Should we protect the S-curves or should we uh, put four lanes over open space? And we want it to be more data-based. So at the end of this conclusion of the summer, we're going to have a massive amount of data. And a big chunk of the money that the city is putting into this is in the data services. Mm -hmm. And we hope that, we hope that um, uh, at the end of the summer, we'll be able to take this database and let it drive our future mobility decisions. So. Um, that, that's that's uh, a really kind of a snapshot of the broad concept around the mobility lab. Um, for really some of the specifics, uh, you want to hear a little bit more about the specifics? Or is that enough for now or questions? Can I answer, Greg? Um, yeah, I was just looking at my phone. I, I've got, um, I'm not sure if I've got them all here, but I've got transit, downtowner, uh, way to park for yeah. the parking system, smart rider for Rafta, and then there's this new app which I don't have yet. I'm excited to try it, yeah. but I'm just wondering how are we going to integrate all these apps? Would it make sense to? Is that part of the yep, program? It is. Good app integration. Uh, Ashley, can you you want can you comment or Barry? Did I get them all? Oh, uh, and, and this is something we're discussing, Greg. We're, we're through and we're partly working through with the Silicon Valley team also on this. So. so we don't have a plan right now to have one app that covers all of those things. <coughs> we have a late entry that may do some of that for us, but I can't tell you today if that's going to happen for Shift. Um, we looked at it. It's just very expensive to do. Um, <coughs> so that was beyond the scope of the three-month laboratory but you identify a need that I think is out there for the future yeah Greg the one thing about this miles app is that you don't you just have to download it once oh, it's miles. downloaded and you, you agree to the terms it's on you don't have to go every morning and log in or push something it's just there yeah. and then your your <coughs> benefits will accrue Got it. So that's does this exist good. already can I find it, it now it, or it's, is it, it, it was it was up in the app store and then they had a huge uh, response and then they pulled it down <laughs> uh, but they're really working with kind of two uh, betas Aspen and Contra Contra Costa, Costa County, outside County of San Francisco and, yep. so so we went out there and talked with these guys and then uh, the CEO came out here and chatted and we've been working on this for a while now and we're they're excited to let us kind of be the yeah but I think they're in two locations currently is that that right and then Barry, uh, you said there's a new entry. Is there a new entry? You mean another app? Somebody else is submitting. Something's happening. Uh, it's has. Just, all I'm doing is teasing you. Yeah. Okay. Well, what no I'm just wondering Greg. is the criteria and well, no more call, on Friday. the so. RFP still open? Like are no, the RFPs are not open. We're we're ready to issue contracts, but we have this sort of late late entry development that may um, integrate all of the contracts into a single provider who has a single app platform. Okay. Great. We, we can share more in a few days. We have to. <laughs> I, I better be able right to now, share so. it next week. Let me, let me okay, say next week. All right. Uh, Marky. Yeah, one of the questions is what's the capacity that you think will be used at uh, Intercept Lot for cars? Well, we're looking to get 600, maybe 800 new cars. So that's our, that's our hope. Um, I think that's the upper end of what we might be able to achieve. So if there's 200 cars now, be 800 to 1,000. So what's the capacity of the lot? 2,000. 2,000 or so? 1,800. 1,800, is that in the paved or is that the unpaved? No, no, no. There's 200 paved, 200, so I think, in the uh, recycled asphalt. The rest is grass, dirt. That's yeah, you know, a lot of dirt. So when we have rains? The monsoons what's the we, game plan we should be so lucky over the summer <laughs> yeah, yeah well I just think we need to plan for every alternative um, all I can tell you is the, the we're gonna try and use as much of the lot as we can well how about the commuters where are they going to be parking well, in the these mud? are four commuters our program is intended to to target commuters well what that lot is frequently pretty darn full. So now with the commuters on Rafta Down Valley. 
I'm, I'm, it's not my understanding that the lot is frequently full. So there's, I didn't there's, say full. But there's, there's 200 paved parking spots, the one closest to Rafta. Uh, there's 180 to 200 cars a day parked there. Uh -huh. Behind that is the recycled asphalt, which is still there, which will be lined so people can park. There's room for 200 cars there. Okay. So we have 400 on a firm surface, let's call it. And then we have, as you're... As you go west, there's yep. about room for about another thousand vehicles there. And then the right hand side, if you decide to do it, there's room for a couple of hundred cars there in addition. Uh, we do have some plans that we're talking about um, as we move forward is maybe making another couple hundred spots there easy to park on. But we're not ready to talk about that at this yeah, moment. Yeah, okay. That's where I was going to We're, gonna we're go. aware. Uh, there, yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, Rachel? Yeah, if it's okay just to tag on to that. I, I think you're going to really need to start talking and thinking about a little more uh, visual screening if you're going to be expanding into those areas. We've certainly heard in the past from residents in Woody Creek and W slash J when we uh, leave big orange barrels up for no reason and things like that it, and storage even of, of existing vehicles. So that needs to be looked at. And I, I think that um, that first meeting in, in March, uh, you guys should really talk about whether you need a placeholder for additional paving to go forward if this is a successful but I would feel if I came in parked in the mud and then left in the right. mud and had to wash my car that'd be the last time I'd use the app you know yeah. or I'd play the game so I you know it's got to be from start to finish you know soup to nuts in terms of how you deal with this so I guess the the questions or comments I would make going forward on on this effort and I applaud the city for trying to think outside the box and, and see what can happen for shifting people's studies. But if, you know, if RAFT is doing over 5 million people a year now, and let's say 2 million of those are in summer now, you're going to be rewarding 2 million existing riders for riding. And maybe that's the right thing to do too. But how will you track the potential increase, uh, you know, whether it's in-town shuttles or the big shuttles? So make sure you have some way to really quantify this and we're not, you know, doing a lot of money and time for a 2% increase or something. The, the second is, uh, you know, being an in-city resident, you know, an awful lot of people used to take the Galena Street shuttle when it ran in the summer and then that was discontinued. Right. And so I think there were some untown transit things that would make a difference um, that I know went away and haven't come back. So, I mean, I live over on the Hunter Creek side of town. We lost the Galena Street shuttle in the summers and the downtowner doesn't cross the Mill Street Bridge. So, you know, we see all these things happening for other people as a resident and then not us. Yeah, and good, so I think you need to point. keep that in mind, which also brings me to my last comment, and that is that uh, I don't think there's been uh, a real origin and destination study done. And until you know current material of why people are going where they're going and when and how they're choosing to do it you're really shooting in the dark I think it's a it's a shotgun approach some of these things might work you'll get some new riders but you know and, and, and maybe there's a more updated more affordable way to do an origin and destination study than the old days when you kind of literally stopped and asked each car where were you going why are you doing that how often do you do this trip you're shooting in the dark and so there's really no origin destination to let people say you know they, they we continue to think I guess of our traffic problems in a very linear way they're coming straight into town and they're the parking in the core or they're coming straight into town we know we see them at the s-curves yeah. but we don't necessarily really know is it just to get back to Mountain Valley is it up to Red Mountain is, is it a one-time truck to Clark's and then go back home so there's no there's no uh, data that you're basing this whole effort on, so I don't know that you're going to get good results out later. Uh, let me say that there, we we do have the uh, cell phone data that was collected, and that now we've we've contracted with someone to put that into a um, website <laughs> so that we can do just what you're suggesting. So uh, now those are you're two tracking snapshots. everybody's phone who's in this room now. Oh, this was the data are. that was collected in 2017, I believe. Um, so it was the AirSage cell first, phone yep. data um, um, that um, Fair and Peers put in a web-based uh, interactive uh, setup. And was that measuring primarily the Rafter route, the Rafter riders, or was it re registering well, everybody who? Rafter who used similar, used some of the similar data for the transit study and the ITSP, but that's more looking at uh, transit and 
rides. This is um, cell based or GP. It was cell based data, but it's a GPS based, and it's looking at um, person trips rather than just transit trips. And well, it was from two periods, one in the summer and one in the. I, I think uh, it'd be great for this whole board to look at that data and get a good understanding yeah, because, because we've, never seen it. we've never seen it. And uh, so it, it doesn't inform our moves as a county or snow masses as snow mass of what they might be able to do to yes. add well, into but, this. I mean, again, my understanding was EOTC declined to fund that. So we went ahead and did that, and we can make that available to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd just be really curious to know how many of these trips are just up to the high school and back, and 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 how do you get those people specifically to change their behavior? Hopefully you know, so you can target. Fund it next time. Yeah. There's huh? a there's a technical report, and then there's a web-based interactive thing. So if you if you recall um, from the earlier piece that there was 47 different uh, zones that were. GPS cell phone base, so you click on one, you click on the other, and it'll, on the, on the uh, web, and it'll put out the uh, connecting data between those different pairs. And it's also grouped, so you can look at Glenwood to Aspen, Carbonell Aspen, Aspen, different areas within Aspen on that site. So uh, we can provide that information on the technical report at the at the next meeting. John, did that include snow mass to the yes. intercept or to Aspen? I didn't think that it did. There was a... There was it's an it's in there. It's, that's snow masses. Uh, it goes all the way from Aspen uh, down to Glenwood and a little bit uh, east and west on I-70. So it doesn't do parachute or rifle. I, I'm not sure it gets that far. I think okay. it goes as far as rifle, and then it has a catch-all for anything beyond that. Yeah, the I-70 east and west is a little. Um, it's a pretty big zone, so I don't know how specific that I is. I just know going west, the buses in the evening are pretty darn full going yeah. to rifle and to parachute. Yeah. yeah. Again, my bigger point is I think it'd be great for this group right. to dive down on that really data great. or get new data if necessary because, I mean, it just strikes me, and maybe it's a small percentage who don't drive with their cell phone with them or their cell phone is off when they're driving, you know, so I'm not sure you're really capturing everybody, but it, if it gives you some luck. But, again, it, you need to kind of say what is this segment driving for and what gets them specifically out of the car and as opposed to just kind of this broad array and we hope uh, enough fish are caught in the net thank you thanks Rachel all right very good thanks uh, Bert. so is there any chance of you having an app that you can buy a uh, raft a ticket like a day ticket or a month ticket or a week ticket because when I travel I can do that I just can't do that I'll, I'll let Dan answer that I, I will share a story that doesn't meet 1985 technology so i appreciate where you're going Bert. But dan i need you to hear adam's story because i heard it 11 times today so oh. can you <laughs> well, it works in San Francisco. So i went to steve and i in a meeting so i went to the um the at the ruby park to buy my ticket so i said i need to i need a round trip ticket i think it's 14 dollars one seven dollars on the way back well we don't sell one-way tickets we don't sell round trip tickets we don't sell single tickets last time we had this meeting i was talking about my frustrations that the machine didn't have them at the 27th Street thing to come back. She, she's very nice. She's like, I can give you change. I'm like, well, um, I, or she's pitched me on a discount card. Mm -hmm. And it's, she said it was $20, a $20 discount for fourteen seventy five, which is great. I said, shouldn't it be $21 instead of 20 so you can get three whole rides? And she kind of looked at me funny, and then I kind of, I just... <laughs> I left with all my, my mega nickels that I've used to pay on the raft of things. So um, I appreciate all this. I'm here. My name's on the list. I'll send you money. I'm here to support Rafta. But I think there's some basic customer service stuff from interacting with being able to spend money, let alone the high rent money, because I think $7 is probably the most you can spend compared to the season passes and everything else like that. But it's really frustrating for daily use people. And once people use it, they will. I'm assuming most people are going to have a good experience, going to want to use it. So if, and the technology is out there. You can't use a credit card, which is 30 years old, and Apple Pay is five years old. And I just, you know, so I appreciate where you're going with the app, but I think it's crazy that you can't use a credit card and a machine to buy a one day, a single day pass or a booklet, or that you can't use a credit card on the on the uh, on the bus. But it's, other than that, it was okay, right? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> the, the drivers are always nice. The, the, the Wi-Fi is always great. So, but I, I think 
Uh, we are not in the 21st century, and it's been 18 years <coughs> of, of... Why don't we let Dan address So well, I'm not sure now is the time to talk about it, but and when I see millions of dollars of upgrades and all this great stuff that we need, I'm fully supportive of everything. Uh, I just think there's some basic foundational stuff that is, is missing from the customer interaction. Well, thank you for, for that. And uh, we are in the process of looking at our fare structure and seeing if we can make it simpler. Um, but I'm not, you were going from Aspen to Glenwood Springs? Yeah, no, I don't have a problem with the fare structure. No, well, no, I don't I, have a problem with the fare structure. Where were you going? I'm trying. Well, I was, was going to Glenwood Springs to Ninth and uh, Grand to go to a meeting. Ruby we'll right. Park to Twenty Seventh Street. Ruby we'll Park to Twenty Seventh Street, and you can't buy it. You can't buy a ticket at the machine to do that. You can't buy a ticket from the person sitting there, which Just is to go to that specific place is what you're saying. I you think the like seven dollar ticket is good for kind of anywhere in Aspen to anywhere in Glenwood Springs, if you will. Yeah, right? I, but and when so you you paid about the same amount in a discount uh, punch Dan, pass. Dan, it's not about the money. It's about the barrier to entry. You can't get on the bus with a credit I, card. I can't get on the bus bill. with a credit you card. Credit card you you the, you these these the are upgrades that would need to be acquired. I mean, we have a fare box that's mm -hmm. electronic, but it needs other pieces yeah. that get added to it to make it it's, so that you can tap on it. It's scary on. that that's not there in 2018. What is not technologically preventable is a person, a live person, be able to sell a seven dollar ticket or a ten back a ten pack of some interval multiple of what the current fare is. And so because what good is, you know, seventy seventy eight percent of a the fare for the next time? Um, well, you can dip it in the fare box, and you could use it again if you hold on to it. So no, no, no. I, I used uh, the mayor's six. I, the mayor had six dollars left over from a 1985 uh, ticket, and it worked. It took it, and I put in a dollar. But I just think that the fact you can't go in and that a person can't go in and buy a single ticket um, is 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 crazy. And uh, this is not. This is not asking to be on. I'm not asking about Venmo. I'm talking about uh, something that how most things operate when, when you go to buy something. Uh, Steve, what do you think? Uh, talking about customer service, within the last three weeks, I, if I was some more other citizen, I probably would vote against the raft of thing mm -hmm. because of my some of my experiences. I had a local bus drive right by me when I was in the stop, you know, a down valley bus stop. They just drove right by. The driver was not paying attention right then or whatever. This is in broad daylight. I got caught by the shift from the one twice an hour to once an hour in the evening and ended up waiting a full hour at a dark bus stop out you know thinking there's another bus coming in a half an hour and then i finally figured out it's coming in in an hour like 8:48 to 9:48, kind of a wait and what was that and i had um i was at old snowmass going down down okay yeah and i just caught that sh the ch the ch change in the from half hour to full hour service at that point and i just missed the half hour bus so then i ended up waiting a full hour and the third incident was i was just walking up to the bus stop and the bus went by a minute ahead of schedule on the local bus going up valley and so I got back in my car and I drove up to the intercept lot to catch the bus, which had to sit there five minutes because they got there five minutes early. So I think uh, it's partly a matter of, I know you get a lot of new drivers all the time and it's partly a matter of training the new drivers. Did you say new drivers? Or did <laughs> new, new, brand new, um, inexperienced drivers who are not used to all the nuances but customer service is number one i think the snowmass village shuttle does an excellent job of customer service that was drilled into us all the time and so i think just to, to pass my experiences on and i will continue riding the rafta but 
sometimes it gets discouraging when that kind of stuff happens. And and I certainly don't blame you. And and I apologize for uh, you know those examples of, of less than satisfactory customer service. Um, what I tell people um, it, that when they um, have similar stories, and I don't receive a lot of them because uh, there are other people that, that feel those complaints, is that when that happens, if you, if you let me know, you know, then I can really step in and do something from a customer service standpoint with that specific individual. Um, you know, I'm happy to share my email address with the public. It's dblankenship at rafta.com, and I, I generally respond to every complaint that we get or forward it to people who can check into it and get back to folks. We have uh, cameras on the buses. Sometimes I get complaints about things that happen on the buses, or we can see uh, where that bus was. We can track it through the GPS system. We are at least have something that yeah. is more modern, uh, hopefully would meet your standards, uh, um, Adam. But um, but when those things happen, I, I'd love to hear about them. And uh, uh, I think the vast majority of drivers that we have uh, do an excellent job, but people can have a bad day. And uh, there are some people that uh, perhaps need to be in a different line of work or need more training. And if people will let me know about those folks, I'm, I'm happy to try to intervene and, and uh, step up our game. But uh, I apologize to you. And, and we'll look into your issue, and then we may come back to the EOTC if, uh, if we need to in the future and make a presentation about what we can do to make it so if you want to go wherever you want to go, you can get a ticket for just that amount and uh, with your credit card. And Hopefully they don't need to come back to do that, and hopefully the raft of funds generate something to stimulate some upgrades with yes, technology. Yes, uh, I mean, that's, that's the hope. But uh, thank you for your uh, criticism, and... Uh, uh, unless you have something else, uh, you'd have another one. Well, just a thought. It's a technological potential solution. Uh, just when somebody's in a bus stop and they can punch in their destination or something and then have a transponder or whatever would signal to the bus that's coming along that there is a person waiting at such and such a bus stop who, for the local bus. Right. That kind of thing would be a technological fix that I think would, um, you know, maybe someday we'll be there, but maybe the technology's not quite there yet for that. Or a shock collar or something like that. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I think that what we encourage people to do, uh, because drivers can be distracted and uh, maybe they're in a zone or something like that, hopefully that doesn't happen too often, is for people to make themselves, especially on those uh, Highway 82 quarter local bus stops, make themselves visible. There's a paddle in the evenings that Some they can fly. Some of you flash. be out there by the curb because they have yeah. flying corners. And, and, and uh, you know, this is more of a nighttime issue than a daytime issue, but in every community that we have uh, infrastructure, bus stops, and so forth, uh, we have uh, night sky regulations in effect. And so personally, I'd like to see those bus stops lit up a little bit more uh, so that uh, people feel safe being there and the bus operators can actually see them because uh, at night, the bus operators, most of them, when they go by those stops, they, they slow down and then they look for a long time to see if somebody's in the in the shelter or on the sides and so forth. Dan, we'll, we'll work and, through that. All the more reason to vote on vote yes on 7A. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get that, we'll get the funds in place. So Dan, at, thank you for uh, the, answering the questions. At, at the bottom of it, uh, you know, I, I bottom line is yes. What, yes. what you just said. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I can't so, say it because I'm uh, Adam and Steve, thank you for your comments. Dan, and thanks for the answers. Uh, Rachel, I just want to respond very quickly to what you said. Um, uh, Shift is very much doing exactly what you suggested, and it's, it's not a broad stroke approach. But it's very, it's uh, very much provides specific services to to specific people to solve their unique mobility challenges, and we have to start someplace. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm, like I said, I support the project. Yeah. So um, it's a good. Uh, I think our thoughts are very much in line with what you're saying. So thank you for the comment. Um, Over here. Uh, Steve, um, I think uh, the intercept lot is definitely going to be an integral part of where we're going in the future. And I think if you saw the intercept lot during the Tough Mudder, you kind of got an idea of, you okay. know, you know how many cars that right. that you know place. The can part hold. of the course is that why it was muddy, or what happened on that? Was <laughs> but it was it was uh, it was right big. Going. I mean, I'd never seen as many cars oh, down there. Cars but parked out in the grass. Yeah, it was it was quite a scene. Yeah. Um, so as we focus on the intercept lot and the integration with town and the evolution of the e-bike 
what is our plan for connecting the intercept lot to the ABC with a bike path? That's a good question. Yeah, it, it's good. It touches a little bit on what Steve brought up earlier from Aspen uh, Country Inn in town across the bridge. And we had talked about, really, we actually talked about this at length inside the mobility lab about a uh, bike corridor mm -hmm. uh, for e-bikes. John, do you remember? We're going to put them in the bus lane, I think. Well, well the, 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 our, the our open space and trails has also really been talking about it. Maybe yeah. there's a place for all three entities uh, who have some open space interest to, to get involved in that. Yeah. You yeah. know, but yeah, I, I know we've talked about it and looked at it. And part of it is, is it a bridge over the Roaring Fork River to connect with the Rio Grande or that it, or back into the um, ABC? It it just proved too ambitious for our three month shift experiment, but. We all recognize it's probably something that needs to be thought about and dealt with for the future. The, the plan is that the intercept's going to go from, we want you to go from your car to transit. Other places closer to town is going to be going from car to a bus. I mean, car to a, car to a bike or right. bus that, to a bike what, or something That's like what that. it became, but we did look specifically at e-bikes at the intercept lot and how we could route them. And we looked at both options, dropping back down behind the intercept lot to come up. I think we also looked at... Um, Jersey barriers, creating a Jersey uh, along the highway bike itself. trail right along the bike trail, but uh, again, that was extremely expensive. Mm. But Billy, uh, we're we're thinking along the same lines, and it's going to be part of a future discussion. Yeah, Bill, that's that's the missing link in the bike path, and I think it is between the intercept lot and the trail system at the ABC. Uh, that's that's what's missing, and it's an expensive link. And it's uh, so Rich you're right. Topic. <laughs> yes. All right, good. It's not a retreat, it's an advance in a different direction. <laughs> hey, good. Uh, Alyssa and Greg. Um, well, I just, I feel like, because most of you probably don't have young kids anymore, but, and I know you don't have young kids anymore, but most of the things I hear from my friends that do have young kids is that this program is really unrealistic. Um, when you're a mom that has diaper bags and kids and strollers, that it's not, I mean, it just, isn't really plausible yeah. to get it off at the intercept lot and get all your things out of your car into yeah. the bus to go into town. And I think that if you want to incentivize people that have kids to maybe, you know, alter their ways that maybe you need to look at something like you get points for limiting the number of times that you actually drive back and forth. Um, because that, to me, is more realistic. I mean, if I was getting points for limiting, I'd condense a lot more of my stuff together. But to ask them to just get off at the intercept lot and by themselves heave-ho everything onto a bus or some sort of transit van is yeah. really unrealistic. Listen, we're not, we're not yeah. doing that. If you, wanna drive, if you wanna drive, drive. No, yeah. no, no, no part of this program a limit says you can't drive into town if you're doing no, it one I way, you know it's just I is. think people don't feel like it's very realistic and they look at some of the people that are making these decisions and they say well they don't have kids and they're a single person and they don't know what it's like to be doing this and that for a family and I think that we should try to include these people in the incentive program and that maybe we need to mm -hmm. like look at ways to do that that's all I'm saying it's, it's, it's so, not going to solve all the transportation issues and we're not it's not war against the car or war against families schlepping their hockey bags around. I, I had two kids that grew up here, and we went through that. I'm, and Adam has has kids, and we've we've had kids. We know we haven't forgotten. Um, we're not trying to ban cars. We're trying to give people an opportunity and a choice. That if they can turn left at the intercept lot, we're giving them an opportunity and an incentive. And I agree. I, I totally understand that. And I mean, my husband gets off and he'll ride his bike into town and, and it is plausible for a lot of people, but I just don't think we should exclude people who really don't have a lot of other options. And that maybe just like when we had to do with the Grand Avenue Bridge, like giving people incentive to just think a little bit differently about how many trips they're making as opposed to just saying it's one or the other. That, that was all I was trying and, to and bring. Let, let, let me just reiterate, we are not trying to solve everybody's problem. There's a Pareto principle at work here. But we are going to do a series of things that will 
attempt to move some of those people into other modes. So one of the specialty buses that we've talked about is a subscription just for the mom that has strollers and all those things. Um, we'll put it out there. We'll see how much interest we have in that. And if that works, that will be one of the specialty buses that will move. You also get challenge awards beyond the miles for doing things like if you park at the intercept lot, you'll get a challenge award that will pay you $5 instead of you driving into town and paying us $5 to park. We'll do it on a daily basis. We'll do things like three days out of five, uh, eight days out of 10. There's a variety of things that the app allows us to do beyond just giving you miles and, and points to challenge you to do things that are uh, maybe a little harder and you get a little more incentive in order to do those things. So a lot of that is, is possible. And if you have ideas for some of those challenges, shoot us an email. I can tell you that one of the buses, the specialty buses that we've talked about was geared towards uh, moms with kids. That, yeah, and I that, think that's great, but it's also too not just having the bus, it's having someone to help that mom. I mean, if you have three kids under the age of five and a stroller and a diaper bag, like in the winter, Getting your kids from one mode to another is difficult, sure. and so I, I, helping hands, I think, I get it, but for that person, the car is probably the best option. Maybe, but maybe they want to change their minds. Uh, Greg, please. To add on to that, I think what I heard from Melissa that really was appealing was that uh, if we can coax people like that into doing fewer trips, consolidating trips and if there's an incentive somehow maybe we, we encourage everybody including those moms to get the app so they can be tracking their own trips and becoming more aware of their own trips maybe there's something to that uh, maybe if we can get them to do five or ten percent of their trips on the bus instead of none th that's a plus that's a win um, when we're talking about specialty buses uh, I hammer on Dan all the time about that I want to take my dog on the bus. And if there's a specialty bus for a dog, we're going to pick up a lot of riders, and I think that would be a great We actually think we'll have more than one specialty right. bus for well, dog owners. Sure. That's part of it. Yeah, but, so that's but that, part of it. That's think, another subscription thing that we'll be offering. Right. Uh, um, and finally, also, I, I, would, I would really support the Jersey barrier thing for Highway 82. I don't think a bridge across the river is going to, Ever get us happen. to the business center. Okay. I want to go to the business center from the intercept lot or to Buttermilk from the intercept lot, and I want to do it on the highway. And if we can do a Jersey barrier off the side as a, as a mobility lab, I'd be yeah. so in favor of that. Yeah, yeah good. Yeah, thank thanks. you, Greg. Great. Okay, Lisa, thanks. Uh, good. Additional comments? Uh, we'll move on to our final item tonight. Uh, John, you've already talked about the ebook, the program at the beginning. Anything else you wanted to add? No, I mean, they're coming. I think it's great. And uh, thank everybody for their support and uh, maybe their patience when we do get them online. Um, in case we, it is a new technology and new buses, and it's going to take a little bit of time to work through it. So thank you and, and be patient, and it should be a great thing. We're Thanks excited. for all the grant work. For those. I know yeah, it's not it was easy. not easy getting those grant funds. And RAFTA had a, the Lono grant, and then the com combining of the Faster grant and and the Senate Bill 221. That, that's something the CDOT's not used to. It's out, way out of the box, and their head almost exploded. But we did get it put together, and it, and it worked. So uh, good, thanks. Um, the carpool kiosk, Mitch. So I'm Mitch Ogier, the Director of Parking and Downtown Services for the City of Aspen. We've been talking about the intercept lot here quite a bit. So um, I would, was looking for some direction from EOTC on moving the carpool kiosk that is currently at the airport and moving it to the intercept lot, which I think was the plan originally way back when, that it made sense to put it out there. Uh, the airport would like us out of the intercept lot. We think it can affect the slip lane quite a bit. Our goal would be to move the kiosk out to the uh, intercept lot at uh, late March or early April of 2019. Uh, we believe that kiosk could also function as a welcome center for Aspen, Snowmass, Picking County, and the U.S. Forest Service, like a, a little miniature um, chamber of commerce. 
uh, at the moment we're open Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. until 2 p.m. We would also expect that we would keep this uh, lot op uh, the kiosk open uh, for special events, maybe Saturdays during the height of the year and a few of those other things. Um, we also think it would be a better opportunity if people have to drive into the intercept lot. You might as well just park your car and get on a bus instead of getting a carpool kiosk or a, a carpool pass to come into town. And it will also give us the ability to um, control and patrol the parking lot out there a little better than we currently do. We go out there three times a day, three times a day now. We go out about 8 or 8.30 in the morning and count cars. We go, go out at noon and count cars. We go out at about 5.15 and can't count cars. Um, one of the questions would be the placement we can talk about in a second, but I'll work with David um, on working on both the location of that and the traffic flow. We have some ideas. As we can see in your packet, our hope is as you drive in, it would go on the right-hand side um, out of the way of most of the uh, uh, cars and et cetera parking at the intercept lot. Thoughts, ideas, direction? Question. Questions? Does this require a land use change by the um, county? Um, at this stage, we're going, planning to do this through a location and extent process uh, through Pickin County. And that process has started already. Do, um, oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Oh, do many people come down Owl Creek Road to use the um, permit? Uh, no, I'm just trying to figure, are you going to lose anybody between the intercept lot and the airport? Uh, we may lose a few. Our hope is that um, the majority of those people that come down Owl Creek Road would park at the buttermilk lot and right, park for free in the front yeah. section and jump right on the bus and to come into right. town. It saves them from having to go down and around and come back because they'll still be stuck in traffic. Um, even with the slip lane, you're going to be stuck in traffic all the way from the end of the slip lane through the S curves. Yeah. Uh, Rachel. So I'm very much in favor of this moving it out there and I've thought about that Owl Creek thing too but they're already beyond yeah. they're coming in up above the kiosk. Um, at the airport we are very short of space and that space where the slip lane is and now I, I think in the long run we'll be able to be very much used by the airport for in some fashion or other. So I really hope that the people will, you know, be willing to turn in there. I th think doing the um, sign, you know, the message sign system would be an important part of it, too, for informing people about that. Right. Please, Rachel. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the issues has always been people going to the slip lane at the airport, the kiosk, with kids who they will be dropping at school, and they get a parking permit pass for HOV vehicle and then they drop the kids off at school and they park anywhere they want in town even though the kids could have ridden the school bus and they're no longer really an HOV vehicle so I think moving it out to Brush Creek you'll gain some efficiencies there as well and that people who come in who aren't um, you know who are from Owl Creek or other areas you can always pick up your HOV pass at the parking garage here in town that's the other location so you know they're already oh, right. half in right. they can they can get it there um, but what I was going to suggest is that uh, as the counties looked at this we would like a greater discussion about um, the slip lane as it is now you have a lot of people who will go in turn into the airport and get into the slip lane to try to beat you know 600 yards of traffic and that's not the intent it's for people who are leaving the airport or, or were picked up by a bus or something and so you know we may have some redesign issues to work with as you're removing that and thinking about uh, do we how do we make the slip lane just for people really exiting the airport um, and without having now people going in and circling around the pickup load off area to get in the slip lane to try to beat traffic. So yeah. we have to do a little d design work with you on that. Good point. Okay, good. Mitch, what do you need from us? Direction? Of, I was uh, just making Cassidy. sure that, you know, making aware that, Everybody that we get support from EOTC. So as we communicate, we have uh, support from CDOT to do this already. So just as I work with Pickin County to go through the uh, the process that we can say that the EOTC supports the movement of the kiosk to uh, the intercept lot versus where Rachel, it is. Rachel, final thought? On yeah, yeah I, I do have another question. I mean, trying to put myself in that commuter's uh, 
space in, in, in their, their place. You're going to have to wait for a traffic light to turn left yeah. into the airport, to the Brush Creek, and then you're going to have to wait for a traffic light to pull back out. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think you'll have to really measure the effect because it, it might be both pushing for a longer traffic light, longer turn signal, if you have enough cars turning there in the morning, but it also might mean that you uh, are losing a lot of people. Right, right. Mm -hmm. We're, it, it's You're aware a big, of that pros and cons. Yeah, yeah. Barry's great race. He can tell you offline about the great race. <laughs> yeah. We're, yeah, Mitch, I'm can you tell us uh, about how many people on average are taking advantage of the carpool? Sure. I sent that to you in the packet. There's about okay. 350 people a day. It continues to grow all the time, but you can use 350 as an average. 350 people or cars? 350 cars. Okay. Um, you know, it's a low of 300 in the off season, as high as 400 in the height of the season. And again, you know, we hope the just to answer your question, Rachel. We hope that the ability to park for free in the residential zone saves you eight dollars today. Um, as we continue to look at parking and pricing in Aspen, we can assume something will be happening in the residential zones as time progresses, because we have not touched prices in the residential zone for over 10 years. So um, again, if eight dollars doesn't make you make <coughs> those two turns. Well, it's five dollars a day in the parking garage. Correct. Thank you. Keep exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. Billy, yeah Billy, good. Sorry. Yeah. I, I was going to raise the same comment. I, I'm supportive of. Is this going to be a trial, or are we making a real? This is, this is moving it out there permanently. Okay. Uh, the, it's a lot of turning to, to, as opposed to kind of a, a two degree angle out, thirty seconds there, and 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 off you go to do the right thing. But if that's what we need to do. Um, I'm not a fan of location and extent when it's used upon me, and I want to be very careful when we do it on someone else. And so if we – do we have a timing issue, or is the county giving us feedback, or – this was not in the memo, so I'm sorry about bringing this up now, but w when I see someone using that, it means that there's some friction that they're using to kind of override something. And so – or was – did the county say you should use this in – in, in jest or in spite or I just don't like hearing those words <laughs> to me or from me <laughs> so <laughs> So uh, in, in terms of the general um, move of the, the kiosk down to the intercept lot, that's actually been something that's been um, part of county planning also. Um, yeah, completely separate from the um, you know mobility lab discussion and such. Uh, the county is uh, the recipient, uh, and we've talked about that here, of a, a FLAP grant. And so the intention was to uh, have this infrastructure down there. As Rachel said, I think there's been some concerns about how that slip lane is being used and how it might be affecting some of the bus traffic there as it gets jammed up uh, with vehicles. And so um, we, we think this is a, a, a good move and, and, you know, something that, that I think, uh, you know, unless my board tells me otherwise, that the uh, county is supportive of and, and something that we've talked about for a couple of years now. Yeah. Good. Thanks, John. Yeah. Adam, good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. Mitch? We're ready to go. We're going to bring it up. We were hoping he'd ask the question. He didn't, so. Mitch, uh, well, we're, we're um, <laughs> sorry, the, the, the location and extent uh, review process, just so that the EOTC is, is aware, and, and Mitch and I are just conferring, I think he was going to bring <laughs> this up, um, includes two items. Uh, one is the relocation of the kiosk. The other it, um, has to do with the mobility lab and its uh, amenities that would be temporary temporarily place in the intercept plot uh, to to encourage folks to get out of their cars there maybe uh, get on a bus and I don't know exactly what those amenities are I believe and the reason I bring it up is I believe both right now are included in the same application process but can be considered as separate uh, issues Correct. and Mitch maybe you can talk yeah, so about I was hoping you guys are. would have asked about the amenities at the uh, intercept lot during the sh shift conversation, but you didn't. So, um, so we've looked at. I'll go one more page, John. First, then we'll come back to that. Sure. Oh, look at that. You're all ready. <laughs> <laughs> we're ready to go we're in for the question. So our hope was, you know, as we've talked, we want to get people to park at the intercept lot during shift, 
and um, we believe that the rewards uh, that we've put together through miles and the challenges will make people do that. In addition, we feel that we need some additional incentives to get people to park there. And the request that came up a lot is it would make sense to put a food truck and a coffee cart out at the intercept lot for the three month test of shift only. We would also put tables and chairs out there. We would expand the Wi-Fi service and we would put high-end VIP bathrooms out there. Oh, okay. That was my good. My yep. Point. These are high-end. These are the ones with <laughs> yeah. um, linoleum tops. There's a... a yeah. yeah, I know. It's okay. like Jazz Aspen. Correct. Yeah. Very ex Jazz Aspen, very expensive. Yeah. Um, and we think that doing something like this could prevent, have more people stop at the intercept lot uh, because if I'm going to come to Aspen and have breakfast anyway and go get my breakfast burrito and a coffee, I might as well take the left as I'm coming from Carbondale, go to the intercept lot, park, get my, get my cup of coffee and my burrito, eat it while I'm waiting for the bus. In addition, we're planning to have five-minute headways during the key times uh, for buses. So right now it's about eight minutes with BRT. Uh, the city would invest some additional dollars with RAFTA to have them be more five-minute. Because the important thing is that we have to beat the race, the great race of a car versus a bus coming into town. Uh, we did an experiment about three months ago, and from seven in the morning until nine in the morning, every half hour we ran a great race between a bus and a car. As you can expect, from 7 to 8 in the morning, the bus, the, the, the bus lost every time, and the car won. From 8 to 9.30 in the morning, the bus won every single time. So not only do we have the incentive of we're going to reward you to park at the intercept lot, we're going to make it easy for you to get a cup of coffee and a burrito, we're going to reward you for doing that, and you might only have to wait three or four minutes for a bus because the bus service would be every five minutes. So this has to be done through... Um, the discussion we we talked about um, and we think that the feedback we've gotten is this will um, maybe change some people to park at the intercept lot and take the bus so what, I do have a question Marky, please. so if you're going to change the um, wait time or down at the intercept uh, from eight minutes to five minutes does RAFTA have that capacity or where is that how are we going to move the buses around? Because it's a whole different schedule for RAFTA. Any service. But where were, where's the buses? I mean, where you, do we have the capacity in terms of the number of buses that we own? The, the physical capacity yeah. or the monetary capacity? It's not nothing about monetary. It's about, okay, you're... I'll go you're, you're for some of them. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, the question is... Marky, yes. The answer is yes. yes. We have plenty of buses? Well, I wouldn't say that we have plenty of buses, and oh. this is... Uh, is this on? Yeah. Um, uh, and, and our operations staff is is looking into it right now to make sure that we have the equipment available to, to ramp up. Uh -huh. uh, we're thinking it might be about a four bus add overall to our service levels. Typically, the winter time is our peak season, and we have the most buses out in the winter. And generally, there are some left over in the summertime and, and even more so in the spring and fall. We think we can do it. You know, we did the Grand Avenue Bridge project and we mobilized right. all of our resources, but we, we would have to get everything running and make sure that uh, we could do it and we're kind of reviewing that now. We have a grant that we just got for four uh, additional over the road right, right. Co coaches and we're not sure we could get those in here in time. And then we also have the battery electric bus uh, pilot project that would bring eight buses uh, to RAFTA, but we're not sure whether those would be here in the summertime or be in the fall. So we might have to use our existing fleet, and if we make the commitment to do it, then we'll make it happen, but it'll be tight. It'll be very tight, because now you've got to get more bus drivers. Well, that, that's, a, that's another issue. That's, a, that's always a concern, but um, we've risen to the challenge before, and we would do our best to do so again. Yeah, I wouldn't advertise at 8 to 5 until Dan figures it out. I know, we know that. Steve, please. Um, my thought is that it might be necessary or might be something to think about to do have a bus just doing laps from the intercept lot into town during the shift, and maybe that was thought of but that, that there are kind of some that, that's what there are some do. times when there's you know it's more than a seven minute wait before the next bus comes right. along 
Shit. John. Yeah, see, these would be supplemental to the existing raft of service in the summer, so it would fill in between the existing BRT and Valley service, and they just run between uh, the Brush Creek Intercept lot and Ruby Park, stop at the BRT stops along the way, and that's all they would do. They wouldn't be going up and down Valley, and they'd fill in mm -hmm. to get the frequency down to about five minutes or so out of the Brush Creek lot. And, and only during the peak commuting time? So it wouldn't be all day. It would mm -hmm. just be during the peak commuting time in the morning and the afternoon. Yeah, and uh, between the um, town park and the the Snowmass Mall, we always look at that as an like an escalator. Constantly, people can constantly be getting on one and right. and going. So if you think of it as an escalator going from during the peak time, getting people in as quickly and efficiently as possible that's the idea okay. upper please so back to Adam's question it seems like the county's on board with the uh, kiosk move but there's a separate piece which is the pretty picture here of the food truck and the uh, fancy bathrooms and everything else is, is that something that, that we should have more yeah conversation Mitch how, how do you want us to proceed regarding the so um, I, I, from a process perspective, um, I, one, the, the intercept lot is a shared resource between the EOTC partners. So we thought <coughs> it was important that the EOTC partners understood the, the two changes, the, the kiosk, um, as well as potentially the temporary use for project shift. In terms of how the, so that would be the discussion why it was introduced um, here tonight. In terms of the process, as Mitch said, this is going through a locations and extent process. So what that means is the city would make the application, and, and I believe that process has started. The application would actually go to the county's planning and zoning commission for consideration, and then they'll look at it for consistency with plans. Historically, the county's land use plans have not allowed for these types of uses in the intercept lot, and the county has denied these types of uses in the intercept lot. Um, I, I won't guess what our um, planning commission is, is going to do, but if they approve it at that point, it's, it's done for the temporary use. If they do not approve it, it would come back to city council then um, for, for their approval. But in regards to the EOTC, because the intercept lot has been a partnership between the three entities, we just thought it was important for the EOTC to be aware um, and to at least consent to, to this part of the, the project move, moving forward on the intercept lot also. Thanks, Bert, did you have a follow-up thought to that? Good, thank you for that, uh, Ward. And this is uh, something I've mentioned before in council and I wanna bring it up here. Um, it's our hope and our desire that this uh, shift is gonna be successful in changing people's um, uh, behavior. And I wanna be sure that we have buy-in from the EOTC that if this is successful, if it decreases traffic in the town, that we, that we have um, uh, acceptance to uh, making it a permanent use, um, this type of uh, um, amenity on a permanent basis. Because if we get people to change their behaviors and then after three months go, yeah, well, that was nice, but you know we can't do it. We can't continue to do it. That's my concern. Well, I don't, I personally have problems committing to something where I've just seen the first time, because we've never seen this before. So I think we might want to have some conversation back at the shop. It, it may be worth to limit right now, uh, just to, if you don't mind, the conversation to the mobility lab so that uh -huh. all, so that the, the city council and all the councils have the opportunity to consider just what you're saying, Ward, you know, what did this contribute to right. maybe the success of moving modes of transportation? And then also what feedback are you getting about the public about maybe impacts and such that are concerns that, that weren't anticipated so that both this body um, and you know you as uh, individual boards can can consider that and and then decide what to make permanent down the road. Yeah, one of I, I have a question, Mitch. Uh, you know, you're talking about the five minute and maybe three minute, eight minute wait for bus. 
and during peak times. These buses are also going to get stuck in the S-curves. So I, I don't, this set looks great on paper, but I, I, I can't, during peak times, the S-curves is overloaded. But I, well, again, I'm a... Uh, I know you're an optimist. No, 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 I'm not a, <laughs> well, that I am too, by the way. But in addition, as Dan got beat up earlier, um, I take the bus every single day from Carbondale to Aspen. Um, my bus, I mean, I get here 12 to 15 minutes faster than a car can, even with the backup at the S-curves. So again, but remember, the whole goal is, you know, so um, it's still faster than driving a car, and that's my point. Again, could it be faster? Sure, but what we're trying to sell to people is we can beat the great race, still could maybe be three or four minutes shorter if we did some stuff, but it's still faster than driving a car between 8 in the morning and 9.30 in the morning, and we prove that. So. Until you get to the roundabout. No, no, all the way. So we timed. Let's just be honest. What we did, because we, uh, it was, it, it, you know, it was Barry's idea. Is again, seven, seven thirty, eight, eight thirty, nine o'clock. We all sat at the intersection of Brush Creek and eighty two, and one person took a left, went to the intercept lot, got out of a car and walk, waited for the bus to come to town. Somebody else drove directly into town. They dropped in the parking garage and went to the doorstep of City Hall. The person who took the bus got off at, at, the, at, at Ruby Park and then uh, came to City Hall at 8.30 and 9.00. And 8 o'clock this particular time, there were some issues. It was faster to take the bus than it was to drive. All the way from that spot, and that included taking the, the left at the intercept lot and in my case I did the seven o'clock bus I waited about five to six minutes for the next bus to came to come so again we've proven and I can send you the results of this task that the majority of time That's between I, 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 I don't want to waste everybody's time I, I understand but I, I, I'm I still call it the Houdini Highway where, when you get to town where did everybody go yeah okay <laughs> you know I mean so I'm the, I haven't had that success that you, you guys have had, I don't know what time of year it was, I don't know if school was in, or school was getting out, when you do these kind of little studies, but I agree, we don't have to waste the time on it, but, but I agree with Marky. On which, on we which? need to talk about this a little bit, I think, before we need to vote on something. This is the first time we've seen well, this. Well, we're not, the, this is a coffee cart at the, okay. that, that's how we're talking about, so. Can I make a clarifying statement yeah. about shift? Uh, I'm Ashley Pearl. I work for the city of Aspen, and I'm running the shift program. Um, what Ward said, I just want to clarify because I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. The goal of shift is not to decrease traffic next summer. The goal is if you are currently sitting in your car and you don't want to be in your car and you're there because you have some barrier to getting on our existing really wonderful transit, we would like to provide some options for you to get out your car. It will not work for everybody. I have a young child and a stroller. It <laughs> will not work for me. Um, but I know that it will work for a lot of people, especially those with dogs or other uh, unique transportation issues. So what we're hoping to do is put all these things out there and see what people use and what they don't, and that will be the way, their way of saying, this worked for me, I want this to continue. And then we will get back together with all this data of what got used and then we will have a lot of conversations, you folks will have a lot of conversations about where you wanna go and where you wanna invest. So to Ward's point, if a coffee cart is a big driver to get, or is a big shifter to get people out of their cars, we'll have that data, we'll present it to you and we'll say, is this something you wanna invest in long term because it was a big deal or we'll say, Turns out nobody wanted coffee and it didn't get them out of their cars and we probably won't be asking you to continue it. So the goal of Shift is to provide you, the decision makers, with as much data as we possibly can on what people actually did and where they were willing to change their behavior and when they weren't so that you can make wise investment decisions in the future. I don't want to sit here a year from now and hear that we failed because we didn't decrease traffic by 25%. We will not do that next summer. I will provide you with at least 25% more options to get out of your car and see who uses them. And 25% more data. And 100% more data. 100% more data. More data. More data. More data. Hey, Steve. So that's just the clarification on what success is and what we're really trying to do is to provide you all with data to make better decisions. Okay, let me go to Greg and then we'll finish with Rachel. Oh, very quickly, while we're collecting data, I, I think about my own experiences. I rush to the intercept lot. I run to get there before the bus does. 
I'm not sure I have the luxury to stop at a coffee cart or stop for a burrito unless it, they're handing it to me as I run by and I can pay for it with my raft of bus ticket or something because if it's a three minute turnaround on buses is what we're talking about, increasing the service, who's gonna have time to stop and sit and have a cup of coffee? I'm wondering, will there be an option to have, maybe it's an automat in the stand that you can get something hot to drink while you're there in line and it goes like that. If, but I don't see people being leisurely out here at the intercept lot. So I don't know if it'll work or not. I'm enthusiastic about the experiment, but I want to make sure we have other options in our data set. Yeah, great. For quicker, faster turnarounds, because that's what it looks like where this is going. Yeah, good, Greg. My only comment on that is that, again, as I watch people, I don't drink coffee, but as I watch people get off my boss, uh, I watch where people go. And today, Starbucks opened about a month ago. Half my bus goes to Starbucks. Well, what I can do is say, what I can say is you don't have to go to Starbucks. You can do the same thing at the intercept lot. It takes you three minutes to get your, your coffee there. But when I get to town, I can go right to work instead of going from, from getting off at Ruby Park, going to Starbucks, waiting 15 minutes for a coffee because there's a big line. And so again, I'm, we're just hoping to say, Mm -hmm. We're going to, you know, the people that go to Inc., people go to Starbucks, people that go to other places for coffee, we're going to let them do it here, and we're saving them time, potentially. And, and Starbucks. Get coffee, yeah. and then get another Starbucks. <laughs> that's, you know, so, but that's why I want to test it, because I think, again, the feedback we've gotten is that if you reward me, and you give me food and coffee, I will use the internet. Can, can I just add one thing to that? I'd love to see it if we could try, as part of this experiment, just to incentivize people to stop and pick up a coffee coupon if they'll stop there and then they can pick up their coffee at one of our purveyors in town so we're not taking business away from them. Yeah. This, this is a good sure. point, Greg. We've, we've talked about this. Yeah, we're, we're, we're sensitive to that. Can so that's good. Up? Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Rachel, Thanks. final thoughts. Here. I am so happy to see restrooms in this yeah. drawing. <laughs> I have pushed for the idea of real flush toilets and spending the money for water lines out there. Good. I'd say that if we get up to 800 more cars a day out there, we're going to need flush toilets right. uh, and not even these temporary mm -hmm. ones so this really comes back to that greater bigger discussion about how much you eat up in operating costs and how much you reserve for capital right. to do the things that will make amenities permanent I can't say that I would support permanently doing this but I sure as heck support an experiment <gasps> and see what happens this summer uh, I, I, I think that you're going to want to try to not have too many spaces taken up for this parking spaces of the asphalt because other people are going to be in the mud <laughs> right but it's got to be big enough to be noticeable and to be attractive as a space and it seems like you're trying to do that this will take up 14 parking spaces 14. out of 200 14 yeah. out of 200 paved that's a lot yeah, of spaces lot right of at spaces. the prime spots. I would really try to think about how to cut that back to, to 10 or so. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. And you, you might not need as much seating area as you think. But, I, you know, I could see if the buses are going to be there in three minutes letting one bus go because I want to talk to my friend a little longer. You know, but it, it, you wouldn't do it if there's only a bus every 15 minutes and you've got to hit that next bus. But so I, I think there's value there. I, I'm willing to try it. I'd love to see it cut back from 14 spaces. I can yeah, tell yeah, you that. Yeah, much. Okay. 14's a lot. So all right, make that's it kind smaller. Of we, that's kind of feedback we'd yeah. like. Thank okay, you. thank you. Great. So is there general support for Mitch to proceed and put this out there? I just want to make sure we got. Steve, please. Um, looking further down the road, looking at the kiosk and potentially having coffee available for the next 50 years or whatever, um, I would take a look at the town park station and snowmass village where they have the you know it's warm in there there's the person there with the information um you can use the toilets and if we had a long range little coffee service or a little snack service in a building like that so i in looking at where the kiosk is located that might you know that that might play into the, like the design of it and the location Thank you. Yeah, good mr mayor so one of the eotc projects down the road is is more of the permanent improvements to the brush creek park and ride which, which involves the flap grant funding and eotc funding and so this is kind of a prelude a opportunity to do some experimentation but the EOTC will have a chance to look at whatever permanent facilities go out there and how they look and how they function. Right. So that's coming after this. Okay. 
John, uh, Mitch, as far as this goes, let's try to make it smaller. Got it. We'll, we'll shrink it. Uh, yeah, and faster. Okay. okay. And Thank we do you. have support for moving the airport kiosk to there does the not seem to be objection to moving the uh, airport. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, Fair. Good. All right, great. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, we have one final item tonight, David, on uh, ballot issue 7A. Or Dan. Or Dan. We'll say David. I'm going to pass on some brochures here. Um, this is the latest uh, brochure that kind of explains the Destination 2040 plan. And the one uh, issue that I wanted to uh, bring this group up to speed on, and, and some of the folks that are on the raft board are already, already aware of this. Uh, in our messaging, we have been telling the public uh, that on a $500,000 market value home, they would be paying uh, 675 a month or 80.95 a year, and uh, all of our all of our forecasts were made uh, using a 6.11 uh, residential assessment rate because we thought that that would be in effect for the assessments that are made in 2018 and paid in 2019. It turns out that it's going to be a, a 7.2. Uh, residential assessment rate that's going to be in effect in 2018, uh, which would mean that people would be paying something closer to 7.95 a month than 95 uh, dollars a year. We met and talked about this at the board um, because of the inconsistency between what we've been telling the public uh, they would be paying and what they would pay with a 7.2. Uh, a set percent assessment rate and the board decided that what it would do if if ballot measure 7a is successful is that they would apply a temporary 0 0.401 tax credit in the first year which would bring what people would pay down to the 675 a month and the uh, 8095 a year so our message would be consistent with what we've been putting out to the public now the um, the temporary tax credit, however, applies uh, equally to both the residential and the commercial properties. So in the first year for the assessments in 18, the commercial properties would actually be paying less than we've been communicating to the public. They would be paying 54.35 a month and 652.21 per year on a million dollars worth of uh, commercial property value. Uh, instead of 6404 and 76850 a year, uh, so, so 6404 a month and 76850 a year. So in the second year, when the 2019 assessment rates uh, would uh, take place, the uh, temporary tax credit would not apply for the 2019 year and in. 2020 when those taxes were collected it would go back to what we've been communicating would be this year and uh, sorry for the uh, confusion we've been this is new the property tax is new for us and and uh, we um, made a, an erroneous assumption about when that ratcheting down because of the Gallagher effect or the Gallagher amendment would take effect Instead of it being on the 2018 assessment, it's going to happen on the 2019 assessment. I'm happy to take any questions about that. Thanks, Dan. Any, any questions about this? All right, good. Dan, thank you for the clarification. Uh, it's public. We talked about it at the RAFTA meeting. It's been covered in the newspaper. Right. Um, and uh, the information is out there. So, Dan, thank you. Uh, Rachel, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I can really empathize with the challenge you've had with that. And uh, Colorado Counties, Inc. has been part of uh, subcommittee meetings all summer long to try to deal with the Gallagher and, and what to do. And there are potential legislative measures that would hold it steady for a little period of time. There's potentials to go to a statewide ballot question to fix it. Other people have suggested, although I've heard the state legislators c couldn't run away fast enough, was that if you start to assess um, VRBO beds as commercial, it changes the commercial residential ratio uh, significantly and wouldn't require the same residential reductions. Uh, but that's still a temporary fix. It's not a long-term fix to the Gallagher issue. And, um, you know, Gallagher was supposed to keep uh, 
residential and, and commercial properties kind of like this uh, permanently, and instead they have gone like this. So it's starting to really kill our small businesses, and, and we all know that issue. But I'm just long way of saying it's going to keep changing yeah. no matter what. There, there's a lot of look at how to how to do something there. Thank yeah, you. Good. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, good. Are we good? Okay. For open discussion or for anything related to? Uh, we can uh, either this or final comments before we uh, conclude, Greg. Uh, just a final comment. This is just a message to all of our elected officials here. I, I happen to have some Proposition 110 banners here. If anybody has a place to put one, I'd love to give you one um, that uh, Jill Ryan gave me. And uh, also I'm recording uh, testimonials from people in support of the RAFTA. And I could record some this evening on your way out the door, something that RAFTA can put up. Uh, for the onboard with RAFTA campaign. If anybody's interested, we could do one in a lit spot here and get it out of the way. And we also are starting to do pop-ups tomorrow. Great. So I'm going to be at Rio Grande Parking Garage at 7.30 in the morning um, <laughs> till about 9.30. And they need people all across the valley at bus stops, at Ruby Park, at the parking garage. So, you know, even if you just have a little bit of time to give, to do that is great. There'll be coffee and donuts tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> all right great uh thank you everybody and final comments good thank you everybody this concludes our uh, eotc session tonight again rachel thank you for everything <laughs> rachel thank you for everything thanks grassroots interested <laughs> in